we're just going to wait one more minute for um, folks to join and then I think we should begin because we're on a busy schedule. Charday, do you want to begin? I know we're on a tight schedule here, so. Sure, I will go ahead and um, get us started. Good morning, everyone. I am really delighted to welcome everyone to the Multi-Regional Clinical Trial Center of Brigham and Women's Hospital in Harvard, or MRCT Center, and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's Conference on Heterogeneity of Treatment Effects in Clinical Trials, Methods, and Innovations. I'm Ruram Rosharde Arojo, the Associate Commissioner for Minority Health and Director of the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity at FDA. Today's conference was organized by the MRCT Center under Dr. Barbara Beer's leadership with the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity, along with a broad stakeholder planning committee with representatives from across FDA, including the Office of Biostatistics, Academia, among a number of others. As Many of you know FDA has continued to work to advance diverse participation in clinical trials, and a key component of that is, of course, the appropriate analysis of subpopulation data. And another driver for today's conference also came from direct feedback from the MRCT Center's large multi-stakeholder working group to advance clinical trial diversity. We hope that today's conference will provide a forum for an engaging and interactive discussion and opportunity to share information on novel approaches to subgroup analyses. And we, of course, look forward to participation from everyone. We um, also are looking forward to answering as many questions as we can, and you can place those questions in the Q&A box, um, and we will field those throughout the meeting today. And we will also be recording the discussion and posting it following the meeting. So now it is truly my honor to introduce the first of our two distinguished speakers to provide welcome remarks, and the first of which is Dr. Silva Collins. Dr. Collins is the Director of the Office of Biostatistics, the Office of Translational Sciences within the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at FDA. Dr. Collins joined FDA in 2019 and brought with her more than 30 years of drug development experience and biostatistics leadership. Prior to joining FDA, Dr. Collins was Vice President of Biometrics at Acadia Pharmaceuticals and has experience leading large global biometrics organizations. Throughout her career, she has emphasized standardization and automation to accelerate clinical development, pioneered large-scale de deployment of electronic data capture at multiple companies, and implemented standardization of biometric systems and processes for large pharma organizations. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Collins. Good morning, and thank you, Sharde, for the introduction. And welcome to all of you to this important conference on heterogeneity of treatment effects in clinical trials, methods, and innovations. Two years ago, in a symposium on this topic, Tom Permat 
posed the question precisely. For a given trial, what is a good estimate of the treatment effect in a 65-year-old, bald, Caucasian male? According to Tom, this is one of the hardest questions in statistics for about 200 years. In the face of heterogeneity in treatment effects, people are entitled to ask how patients like me respond. What does like me mean? This is the fundamental question. What are the components of heterogeneity? There has been a progression at the FDA in the approach to drug development, which is illustrated in the slide that you see. From merely demonstrating safety in a broad population to precision medicine, that is treatments that are indicated, for example, only for patients with specific genetic variations. There's a continuum between precision medicine and treatments to which the entire population is indicated. Broadening the trial population to include subgroups that are less likely or even unlikely to respond to the treatment increases the likelihood of false negatives. That is, it dilutes the average treatment effect by the inclusion of unresponsive patient subgroups. Multiple subgroup analyses increase the risk of false positive results. From the standpoint of statistical power, efficient trial design calls for homogeneous, homogeneity of trial population in every anticipatable respect. In the limits, we have precision medicine that targets, for example, specific genetic variations. And in the opposite sense, we have a clinical trial with no exclusion criteria whatsoever. In the former case, no sponsor would conduct a trial that included a large number of patients who lack the genetic variation. In the latter case, no sponsor would conduct trials that include infants, pregnant women, or patients with certain comorbidities. In the real world, we operate between these limits. The question before us today is, to what extent do we embrace heterogeneity without unnecessary risk to patients and without unduly reducing statistical power? The design and analysis of clinical trials play a critical role in understanding and assessing homogeneity of treatment effects. When significant heterogeneity is anticipated, pre-specifying meaningful subgroups should be an important part in the planning of study design, analysis, and inference. Regulators must remain cautious in the interpretation of treatment effects and decision-making in the presence of significant heterogeneity. At this conference, we will hear from speakers and panelists from the FDA, academia, and industry about methods and innovations in assessing and understanding heterogeneity in clinical trials and about challenges for regulators, clinicians, and patients in the interpretation of clinical trial results. I am looking forward to an informative, productive, and perhaps provocative discussion during the next couple of days. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Collins. And it's now my pleasure to introduce our next um, speaker, Dr. Barbara Beer. Uh, Dr. Beer is the co-founder and faculty director of the MRCT Center, a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital, and a hematologist oncologist. Dr. Beer is also the director of the Regulatory Foundation's Ethics and Law Program of Harvard Clinical and Translational Sciences Center. Previously, Dr. Beer served as Senior Vice President of Research at Brigham and Women's Hospital. She initiated the Brigham Research Institute, the Innovations Hub, and was founding director of the Center for Faculty Development and Diversity. Dr. Beer also led the development of the MRCT Center guidance document on achieving diversity, inclusion, and equity in clinical research. And I had the opportunity to serve on that working group with her, along with others from FDA, and a large multi-stakeholder working group, as we talked about earlier. I'd like to thank Dr. Beer and the MRCT Center for their leadership in organizing and hosting this meeting today. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Beer. <laughs> 
Thank you, Sade. This is my pleasure and I want to welcome everyone to this conference. I'm going to spend a few minutes sort of reviewing how we got here and what we are going to be talking about. But I want to add my thanks not only to the working group that came, came to this, but also to the planning committee who spent hours uh, thinking about how to organize this conference. Could I have the next slide, please? So I want to make sure that you all know that um, all, all of us are speaking throughout this conference uh, as individuals and we do not imply endorsement or reflect the views or policies of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration or affiliated organizations or entities of any member who has contributed or will contribute throughout the conference. We speak and, and present in our individual capacity. The MRCT Center is supported by voluntary contributions. You can read those on our website and grants. Um, and this conference was supported in part by a, a conference grant from the FDA. Could I have the next slide? So the, the goals today and tomorrow are to gain a common understanding of the goals of subgroup analysis to establish, if we can, standards for assessing the effects within subgroups and for defining meaningful differences in effect between subgroups. To review the characteristics, assumptions, advantages, and limitations of traditional and innovative models for subgroup analysis. To review the contribution of data visualization to complement statistical modeling approaches and interpretation. And then as we, as we are able to develop and communicate recommendations. Um, as, as Chardet said, this conference will be posted afterwards um, and we will be presenting a summary document as well. Could I have the next slide, please? So for those of you who don't know the MRCT Center, we are a research and policy center at Harvard and the Brigham and Women's Hospital dedicated to improving the integrity safety and rigor of clinical trials. Um, we look at the conduct, ethics, and regulatory environment with a particular focus on multinational clinical trials and do the work by pulling together diverse stakeholders to define emerging issues in global clinical trials and then to really not stop at a white paper but to, to try to develop together uh, ethical, actionable, and practical solutions, believing that if we do pull together all of the various uh, groups affected by a problem, that any solution is more likely to hold. Could I have the next slide? So this conference grew out of an MRCT Center initiative focused on diversity, inclusion, and equity in clinical research. And just to give you a sense of that, we started this um, work at, in, in, in 2017, um, what, after we saw the publication from the FDA of their report of the participation of, um, of diverse subgroups in cl clinical trials in the first publication of the Snapshot Report, a very helpful report from the FDA, and this is only one example from that report, um, which showed that um, despite knowing that, um, that uh, for instance, Blacks and, and uh, African Americans were uh, suffered from uh, greater severity and in incidence uh, in cardiovascular disease and oncology, those trials that informed the registration of the products in that year, and that is why it's a snapshot, the Blacks and, indiv and African American individuals um, represented less than 3% of the population. Now, as you'll hear later in the course of the discussion, the U.S. data is different than the, than the uh, global data, but this is the data that we saw that made us want to pause and reflect on whether if we had such evidence, we could really focus on improving diversity, inclusion, and equity. Next slide. This is not a, a problem that is going away. Um, as we all know in, in this pandemic, uh, when one adjusts for age, race and ethnicity widens the gap, not only in infection, but also in mortality compared to whites. Um, and um, even with uh, specific attention to this uh, disparity and understanding this disparity, 
um, they under underserved population will remain largely underrepresented in research. Could I have the next slide, please? So um, basically in the back the background to this is that clinical trials are needed to develop new treatments and vaccines. Um, and we believe that the participants in the trial should reflect the population affected by the disease or those intended to utilize the intervention. And that while we often assume so, we shouldn't assume that all uh, individuals respond similarly to all interventions. We know that there's great heterogeneity in response. But we can only assess those in the, that we have studied and underrepresented underrepresentation in clinical trials of Black, Latinx, Asian, Native Americans, and other underserved populations, as well as women in certain therapeutic areas, individuals at either end of this age spectrum, rural and other hard to reach communities is not new. It persists in both industry and academic trials across therapeutic areas, although that is variable. This is one example of subgroup of the subgroup problem. Another is the regional variation that we see across countries. Now, if you look at something like age, it's easily defined, it's well-defined, but it's variably analyzed by, by uh, companies and by, by academ academics uh, at a, uh, during a trial or after a trial. Race and ethnicity, on the other hand, are not biological determinants, and yet we apply uh, some statistical analysis to those differences. And social determinants of health are differences that we often fail to capture in data um, have a real impact on biology. And we should be appreciating those elements that we don't even uh, uh, account for now. Diverse representation in clinical trials is not simply a matter of biology, but it's also a matter of health equity, fairness, and public trust. So the real tension then is understanding on the one hand, biological variability, and on the other, um, providing for health equity uh, and, and, and public trust. Could I have the next? So as, as Silva said, you know, the question for regulators is, is it safe and is it effective? And the question for patients is, is it effect, safe and effective for me? And um, with that, could I have the next slide? So this was the leadership of the work group, uh, Chardet and Milena Lolich from the FDA, as well as others that served, uh, Luther Clark from the uh, uh, cardiologist from Murray, David Strauss, who you'll be hearing from, a psychiatrist at Columbia University, members of the MRCT centers, and then a significant number of really terrific contributions from a large work group. Could I have the next slide? I'm not going to have time to review the document, but you can find it on our website. Um, and it uh, uh, is, um, uh, we hope, comprehensive and helpful. Um, could I have the next slide? Just to give you an, a, an appreciation of the numbers of people that, uh, that um, contributed, here they are. I'm not going to read them, obviously, but they are diverse um, uh, and in affiliation uh, and represented a real variety of uh, individuals. Could I have the next slide? So when we did this work, we really uh, took a broad definition of diversity, age, sex, uh, gender, although uh, we often say gender when we mean sex, um, race, ethnicity, ancestry, social determinants of health, comorbidities, and others. And while, while we will talk about certain subgroups, each of these subgroups actually are uh, a subgroup problem, as it were, um, and found that there are barriers to inclusion at all levels for all, uh, all engaged stakeholders in the clinical trial enterprise. And we develop practical recommendations for each stakeholder and for each part of the clinical trial from drug development planning through the trial planning, through the trial conduct to the analysis, et cetera. Could I have the next slide? But we're gonna to focus today on the subgroup analysis. Um, uh, and we're gonna park for, for today and the data collection issues. Um, and we know that we need to advance common standards. 
We need to develop standards where none exist, such as for the LGBTQI community, for social determinants of health, for ancestry, and we need global adoption of those standards. Um, and we appreciate that there are gonna be difficulties in establishing that, but without those standards and without global adoption of those standards, the interoperability of data globally will be difficult, and we need that in order to promote secondary analyses. Could I have the next slide? So the real question is, who do we include? How do we think about that inclusion? And how do we think about the analysis? Um, and while there has been underrepresentation in clinical trials of many populations, it turns out that when you, when you look at the data of those who ask, for instance, in cancer trials, Black and Latinx uh, uh, populations, say yes and complete the trial uh, to the same extent as white participants. So the, the issue is not only analysis, but also access, um, education, and bringing uh, everyone into the fold. Um, we're not gonna be talking about those issues now, but I wanna refer you to the document uh, for some of our thinking on that uh, very important issue. Could I have the next slide? So, you know, one of, the, one of the issues, as Silva said, is that, you know, one needs to have eligibility criteria that includes um, a, a broad swath, swath of uh, participants uh, as safety would allow. And the FDA has just come out with its um, final document on uh, eligibility criteria and enrollment practices and trial design, and I refer you to that. But what matters is not only whether patients are eligible, but whether they're enrolled, as I mentioned, and retained. And one can provide for access by eligibility criteria, but there may be still too few individuals in that subgroup to be meaningful. And you cannot power a, a trial for every subgroup. In fact, if you had enough, uh, um, that's not to discount the larger trials, but uh, as you see here, very few patients allow for great latitude in um, the hazard ratio. Could I have the next slide, as you'll see later. So if we cannot account for all dimensions of diversity in any individual, in the trial itself, in the product development program, and after all, for any individual, they represent in themselves individual differences and different dimensions of diversity. If we cannot power a trial to assess those differences in a statistically meaningful way without significantly increasing the enrollment numbers, and for certain subgroups, that's unattainable, um, what should we do? And I don't want to discount the value of larger trials, but balancing the importance of cost, study duration, and delay of regulatory review and approval we balance that with a further understanding of safety and efficacy, which is by definition in any clinical trial incomplete. And the more analyses that are performed, the greater the problem of multiplicity and the likelihood of a false positive. We need, however, some measure of heterogeneity of treatment effect. Um, and in, enrolling a diverse population provides the best opportunity for an informed analysis of important subgroups whereby disproportionate benefit or risk would lead then to additional study monitoring or directed analysis. Next slide. So the clinical significance is to say the following. The more homogeneous the study population, the more likely the results will apply to others exactly like them, but may not apply to individuals from a more heterogeneous population. The greater the diversity in the trial, the more variability and heterogeneity of the result, and the less applicable to the individual um, patient. But what matters in the end to the individual is whether the individ in, uh, intervention works and whether the benefit is likely to outweigh the potential risk of harm. It probably matters less well how well it works rather than that it works since there will always be individual variation. The healthcare provider must understand that and choose, must choose to prescribe, and the patient must trust not only the provider, but the system, 
And I should mention that no clinical trial will account for personal preferences and choice. So the real question is, will it work for me? We're going to discuss that for the rest of the two days. And could I have the next slide? And with that, um, we're starting with the keynote address uh, and um, then followed by a, a panel that will look at challenges for the regulator, clinician, and patient, population safety and efficacy, but individual treatment, really thinking about each of the different perspectives and how we approach this problem. We'll have a short break, and then we're going to talk about uh, uh, goals of subgroup analysis, assessing the standards for analysis of differences and limits of interpretation, and then subgroup identification, why we do it, the impact in the methods. Then we'll close and begin again tomorrow with statistical um, methods two. I think I forgot statistical methods one in there. I'm sorry. Um, we'll have a discussion and then data visualization, statistical methodologies, and uh, an, uh, another overarching uh, discussion um, and draw the, uh, to conclusions. I do want to suggest that as you think of questions, please put them in the Q&A, and as you think of innovative solutions or approaches, please also alert us. We will be trying to find those throughout. And with the next slide, I want to introduce our keynote. Uh, Rob Califf um, is currently well known to everyone uh, and at Verily Life Sciences and Google Health, uh, where he's responsible for strategy and policy. As everyone knows, he is the former commissioner of the Food and Drug um, uh, of Food and Drugs for the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, um, and he his long career dates uh, 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 at Duke, where he was is. Um, the Donald Fortin Professor of Cardiology, the vice was the Vice Chancellor for Clinical and Translational Research, the Director of the Duke Translational Medicine Institute, and the Founding Director of Duke Clinical Research Institute. Um, he, is the, he was the co-PI of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research uh, Institute Network um, and is a member of the National Academy of Medicine, among numerous other awards and honors. He's um, what, probably define himself as a, uh, as a, as a trialist at heart, um, a, but I would think of him as uh, a clinician, a visionary, a mentor, and a friend. Um, and I look forward to hearing his uh, keynote on system redesign needed to make sense of, of findings that suggest heterogeneity of treatment effect. Thank you. Over to Ron. Thanks, Barbara. Let's see if I can get control of the um, screen here. Um, let's see, I think this is the right one. Up. Let's see. Let me go back and get the one next to it. Well, all right, we'll, uh, we'll make do with this one. I, I think I'm one version behind, but that's okay. This will, this will, uh, should do fine. So really appreciate the chance to talk to the group and um, given the um, amazing talent you have uh, during the sessions, it seems like there's not that much I can add, but I'll do my best to um, uh, sort of up the ante, I hope. Um, you know, it was dawning to hear Barbara, you, uh, or, or Silva describe uh, a quote from a statistician that this is a 200 year old problem. And I feel like it's been the major problem that has stimulated my career. Um, and I can't say that I figured it out. So I'm gonna raise some of the questions and really look forward to the next couple of days of learning from everyone. So these were the, um, the stated goals of the meeting. <clears throat> Barbara, you've already been over them. So I'll move on to how I think, uh, or at least I hope we can reframe uh, the question. Um, at least in my view of it, clinical trials are designed to measure the effect of treatment on the population, but we care about both the population and individual, and you made that point really well in your introduction. And in practice, uh, it's, it's usually the absolute effect of the treatment on benefits and risks that we're concerned about, not the relative effect, and yet most of the displays that we talk about 
deal with the relative effect. We also know that um, each individual and groups of people have amazingly complex underlying um, combinations of biological, behavioral, social, environmental context. You made that point too. But we rarely actually take that into account when we make decisions. So to me, the question is looking forward um, in this new era of wide scale digitization and computation and availability of information, how do we best construct a system and a way of analysis that accounts for this complexity and supports better decisions? Because we have ample evidence now that the individual clinician left to him or herself with a patient in a hurried context of clinical care has a lot of difficulty assimilating all this information. So I want to quickly just acknowledge um, progress and I, I want to really congratulate MRCT and the FDA in both the recent uh, guidance and uh, the tome put together by MRCT, which I still haven't read all of, but it's in the hundreds of pages and has a lot of really valuable information. My main point is that um, we've known that diversity in clinical trials was a problem uh, for a long time, and it became a real target of policy um, at both the FDA and the NIH um, a little over uh, a decade ago. Uh, and I want to acknowledge all the people that have worked so hard on this. And so um, as you pointed out, Barbara, when we look at um, uh, diversity um, from the FDA perspective, we're dealing with a global population and we get numbers that look like this. We're, we're actually from the report that just came out with five years worth of data, we're doing pretty darn well with regard to distribution of sex and reasonably well with age. And, um, um, but from a global perspective, you know, the racial breakdown uh, raises questions. But when we look at this and divide between the US, which we're, uh, the FDA is accountable for, and rest of the world, uh, we begin to see some differences that are interesting. Still uh, looks good for sex distribution, but I do wanna point out that um, due to a lot of hard work, when uh, enrollment occurs in the US, you know, we are now uh, for the most part enrolling uh, a population of uh, participants that reflects the underlying population um, in the US. And um, I know it's not the main topic today, but it's sort of, is an example of how difficult this issue is that in a global um, industry, what is the right representation of any subgroup? And um, I think you nicely pointed out that sample size um, is, an, is an issue. And I'm gonna certainly take the position that uh, rather than constantly trying to make trials smaller and smaller, we really ought to think about how to economically make trials larger so that we can uh, get a better estimate of heterogeneity. Um, and uh, Barbara, you showed this slide, which is in the report, but I just want to point out to people, this is the global look, not the US only look. And I know the FDA is working on parsing the data more and there'll be many more reports. And uh, I certainly believe that in order to nail this problem and have policies that continue to work, we need to have the data displayed in multiple ways so that we can make sure that our policies uh, are achieving the goals. So now that we generally have representative populations for US enrollment, you know, it's obvious that we need policies that sustain this achievement, but what do we do? We're sort of like the dog that caught the car. Um, now we have these uh, uh, subgroups, uh, as we call them, what inferences can we draw from them? This takes me all the way back to my first day as a clinician and my first day of being involved in policy a few years apart, thank goodness. Um, and, and these are the fundamental questions. Does the treatment work at all? If it does work, in whom does the treatment work or not work? Is the magnitude of benefit and risk worth it for certain types of people? Um, and as you pointed out quite well, uh, we all have the question, what about me as an individual? And I'm going to argue that given that people are characterized by this increasingly computationally possible um, complexity of all these factors, um, how do we um, take this into account to measure risk and then define the benefits and risks of various interventions? <clears throat> 
this is sort of my summary, and I'm going to speed through the rest of the talk um, to make sure that uh, the people who really know what they're talking about quantitatively um, can, can teach us. Um, but from the point of view of all clinicians and policymakers, average treatment effects are just not satisfying. You, you just have to figure somebody has to know in whom the treatment works. And I learned quickly as a clinician that if I said, I don't know, uh, many patients and families would say, well, the doctor down the street knows, so I'm going to go see that doctor because they know. It's also just almost 100% for sure that when we don't have an overall treatment effect, if we look hard enough, we can always find a group in whom the benefit appeared to accrue, and I'm involved in several such episodes right now. When we do have a treatment effect, if we want to save money or resources and don't underestimate the degree to which this is going on in our uh, American health systems today, we can almost always find a group in whom no benefit is apparent. And we have to ask the question, is that real? And then we now have precision medicine, which makes subgroup thinking even more alluring because we do know there are biological modifiers of treatment effect and they can be measured. To make it even harder, the human brain is basically hardwired for decision-making based on heuristics. And there's a long literature on this. It's just, uh, it's just the way that our brains have evolved. But when health effects are due to multi-dimension system in inputs, not binary slices that are pictured by subgroups, how do we bridge this gap in the way our brains work? The appropriate focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion shines a light on the issue. Uh, but we have some burning platforms right now in front of us this week that are going to be argued about and um, uh, about which policies are going to be made that I want to highlight. So now uh, the fast uh, forward part of the talk, because these are all things that you know. In the MRCT report is the classic, what I call blobogram, that we've all come to know and love, those of us who like to look at data, because they do show us binary slices of groups of people and give us some estimate of the size of the subpopulation and the estimate of the treatment effect in that subpopulation. But of course, the problem is um, in issues like a diversity of enrollment, we almost never have a large enough sample size to have um, an adequate estimate. And furthermore, people are not represented by just one factor. People uh, come in multiple sizes and shapes and combinations, and these are not at all re um, reflected by these types of diagrams. Other things that have affected me along the way is, of course, the issue of multiplicity, which um, I know we'll talk about quite a bit over the next two days. Uh, you know, the real introduction for me was the famous ISIS um, observation that when they looked at the ISIS trial of aspirin, there was a magnificent treatment benefit with a tiny p-value. But uh, when looking at astrological signs, the Libras, which I'm one of, and the Geminis got no benefit. And uh, this uh, was actually published. And it was interesting that much like misinformation on the internet today, a lot of people actually believe that the ISIS investigators thought it was true when the purpose of publication was really a spoof on the concept. And then I was greatly affected by this uh, slide, which was part of the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative uh, patient group. Uh, Bray Pat Patrick Lake came up with this slide. It's a really simple depiction of something we all know is true, but is not reflected in binary subgroup slices. If we said, well, we have uh, blue and red people and turquoise people, um, and all these characteristics are intertwined, we now end up with um, three or more characteristics all at the same time. And we have to figure out how to represent um, this diversity when we go to apply the results of a clinical trial uh, to people. Also very much influenced by Dave DeMetz, and I think a lot of us uh, at this meeting have been influenced by Dave, and I had a chance in 2002 to reflect on what we had learned together as a clinical investigator and a, a preeminent statistician, and um, much of this also came from interactions with, with uh, Richard Pito and many of you who are in this uh, meeting. But, um, you know, the fact is that most treatment effects we see are not huge, which makes it even harder when we go to parsing the data. And um, true um, qualitative interactions are relatively uncommon, although we now have to question this as precision uh, targeted therapy gets more common and we get better biological understanding. But it's just simply the case that most of the time when we see 
qualitative interactions, they turn out to be false positive, particularly when we try to replicate them. But quantitative interactions are 100% uh, common. They always occur, but they're multifactorial and they can be quite important um, as I'm gonna uh, show you. And it'll be no surprise to you when we think about uh, therapeutic antibodies and vaccine for the pandemic. And we have this uh, problem that um, no matter what we find, uh, what Frank Harrell used to call the historian's rule, we can always think of an explanation for a subgroup finding. In retrospect, uh, it always seems so obvious. So I did like the recommendations from MRCT. I'm not gonna go through them here in detail, but I think of uh, these recommendations as something I would call subgroup etiquette. These are things that we should all keep in mind and we should do. But in no way do I think that these are gonna solve the fundamental problem that we have, and particularly uh, with what I'll show you at the end about the pace of change we're gonna see in the application of data uh, in clinical practice. Uh, there was one suggestion, which I hope will be a topic of um, discussion as we go through um, uh, the detailed uh, um, uh, speakers' uh, talks, but a uh, concept that's in there is that, well, we can't do um, uh, clinical trials that would include uh, every ethnic subgroup in all of the hundreds of countries in the world who all have a stake uh, in a global medical products industry. And so we're gonna have to validate using real world data. And that brings in a whole other set of issues that we need to um, understand and work on. And this will certainly happen. So now, how are we applying these principles in the most pressing issue of our time? And I'm sure all of us, before we got on this call, took a quick look at the news to see uh, what was going on. And ASIP is meeting this week, and the FDA uh, Verback Committee is meeting uh, next week, and we'll soon have vaccines distri distributed. And now we have EUAs also for uh, therapeutic antibodies. So let's talk just a second about therapeutic antibodies. Uh, no benefit in people sick enough to be hospitalized, a reduction in symptoms and need for medical attention, and hospitalization in people who are treated early. Um, but most people with COVID-19 are either asymptomatic or minim minimally symptomatic early on. Um, and there's a medical axiom, it's hard to make an asymptomatic person feel better. And so there are gonna be a lot of questions as these antibodies roll out about in whom should they be used. So we need to come up with a subgroup of people should be treated and the subgroup who should not be treated. Um, we now know among people with a positive PCR test who's high risk. It's the older age and significant comorbidities group. But we also know people of color and people of Hispanic, Latino ethnicity are at higher risk for bad outcomes. Oh, and, and by the way, we don't have enough supply to treat most people uh, who are in these high risk groups. And so there's gonna be further parsing of the data to come up with subgroups who are most in need of treatment. And this is what's in the uh, EUA um, uh, data uh, information that was put out uh, by the FDA. And I, I think it's quite good, but it does reflect this issue that we're gonna grapple with over the next couple of days. Everything in it is a binary slice. Um, adults and pediatric patients, et cetera, high risk. And if you have any one of these, um, then you're eligible for treatment. But we, and um, I'll note at the bottom, there is no mention of race, ethnicity, whether you're in a hot spot or whether there's alternative medical care for you. And if we think about urban, rural, um, all these other factors, it is going to be a major issue how health systems and communities and public health agencies make recommendations to people who have just gotten a positive te test back and are not yet feeling sick enough to feel like they need uh, to go to the hospital. So I'm hoping we'll get some insight over the next two days into how this might be handled. And then of course we have the big uh, kahuna, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, which um, almost certainly will be out um, over the course of December. They're, they appear to be highly effective. We'll see the data at the Burbank uh, meeting. The trials uh, from all indications did a good job of enrolling a representative US population. This doesn't address all the needs of other countries which also have race and ethnicity um, issues to address. 
but there are not enough cases you have to calculate relative and absolute benefit as a function of these characteristics. But we do know about underlying risk. And so higher risk people are scheduled to get the vaccine first. But these risk strata are based on dichotomous criteria. And these um, you know, are going to be modified by the ASIP meeting this week. But you'll note that um, under these um, criteria, um, a 66-year-old uh, person who's in perfectly good health, you know, will get higher priority than um, some other categories of people who may be much higher risk based on simply where they live um, or their race or ethnicity. And, you know, I'm not proposing I know how to deal with this, but um, I think as, as we discuss uh, these issues over the next several days, we ought to keep in mind how we can be helpful in informing uh, both the public and policymakers about the implications of the decisions that are going to be made over the course of the next several weeks. So now finally, just a quick glimpse into where I think the future is headed and a reason why everyone on this call, I believe, should be highly motivated um, to move the field along. Maybe it's taken 200 years to get here, but uh, we need to go in warp speed, so to speak, over the next two to three years. We're now living in a background of automated, curated uh, data that's collected in real time. We're moving towards a system of embedding clinical trials in practice. And calculation of multidimensional uh, models is going to be possible to assess the implications of treatment effect of interventions um, through uh, the use of uh, digital computer support. And so this real-time computer support obviously is going to need to be overseen both by clinicians and it's going to need to be monitored, but the um, essential principles upon which they're monitored are going to depend a lot on the kinds of things that we're going to talk about over the next several days. And the concept, you know, is easy to diagram. This is uh, uh, from an article recently published in Journal of the American College of Cardiology. But the concept is that we can integrate all this information at the bottom and analyzing the data, uh, taking into account the results of clinical trials and practice guidelines, provide decision support to the decision makers, the patients, clinicians, and families, and end up with a much better decision for the individual. And Tom Pearson has spearheaded the effort at NHLBI to think about this the same way with regard to public health. And I believe if you look at what we all follow now, things like the COVID tracking project, in fact, we get a daily update on the status of COVID for every county in the United States every day. And there's absolutely no reason why this is not possible for all chronic diseases uh, just as much uh, as it is uh, for the pandemic. And so as we assemble groups of people, this trade-off between what might be best for an individual or the synergy of what's best for the individual and populations will be important. And I think Francis Collins and his usual, usual folksy way put this in words pretty well. Um, we don't uh, go to the store and say we want a pair of shoes. We, we talk about the size we want. Um, and so uh, we've got the same problem in clinical practice. Then finally, just a race through a couple of slides at the end here. This is obviously way too complex for an individual cognitively to absorb. And uh, computing is going to take care of this. But again, we need principles for the computer to work. And if we think it's complex now, the unraveling of systems biology is showing us that, in fact, um, at the level of um, the cell, the organ, the tissue, uh, the intact human, uh, the group of humans or the environment, um, it's all interrelated and uh, we're going to have to come up with ways to compute it. And so mostly what's uh, reflected so far is just a reflection of this age old parable of the blind man and the elephant. We're looking at one slice of the elephant at the time when we know we should be looking at the whole elephant. And uh, this is just reflecting what I'm doing, so I'm not going to dwell on it, but we all know that it's now digitally possible to measure and interact with people pretty much continuously if they want to do it um, to provide digital information that can reflect this heterogeneity. And efforts um, like ours and the one at Apple and uh, almost all universities are moving along to make this possible. And I think we're now uh, in a phase where it's going to happen. And we can look across these various levels of phenotypes and come up with thousands of subgroups.
And so as uh, the brilliant uh, quantitative minds think about this, how do we reduce this in practice is the question. We have some sentinel examples like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where depending on the slice of the human you look at, you can get a very different view of uh, where the therapies are effective and where they're not, uh, we're gonna have to integrate this information. So I'd like us to, at some point, to have this uh, vision rather than the blind man and the elephant, looking at the whole elephant and the herd of elephants and how they interact with the environment, which is now computationally possible, but cognitively an amazing challenge. And if you don't think this is possible, I'm just gonna uh, just quickly mention one example that's been published it's now possible to stream electronic health record data in real time, um, apply algorithms in real time, and then produce decision support that notifies the clinical team using their cell phones that this patient um, needs your attention because there's a risk and there's a possible intervention. All of the rules that dictate when this alarm should go off and what intervention should be used in which people um, will be a result of the kinds of thinking that will be reflected in these next two days. So uh, my conclusion is we've made a lot of progress with regard to diversity, but now we are like the dog that caught the car. Um, in the short term, better subgroup adequate will certainly help. And in the longer term, we got to move to a different level where we don't talk about subgroups anymore. We talk about underlying risk and modification of treatment effect that reflects the whole person and uh, the populations of people that live in different places with different levels of risk due to social and environmental um, effects. So I appreciate uh, the chance to talk and look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you so very much, Rob. This, this was really a, just a wonderful perspective and as always gets us to think uh, aspirationally as well as um, you know, where we are today. Um, given the time and the absence of questions in the Q&A box, if it, if it works for you, please do post them. I'm saying that to the panelists, but we'll go on to uh, the first panel moderated by David Strauss from Columbia. David? Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm David Strauss. It's really been my honor to be a member of the leadership team of the MRCT Diversity and Inclusion Working Group. And the conclusions of the working group included the ideas that each player in the treatment development enterprise has responsibility to promote the goals of diversity and that shared understanding of the importance of this goal and cooperation among the stakeholders is essential for progress. Um, the first panel presents uh, uh, and introduces the perspectives of key stakeholders on the central questions of the day. Why is diversity in clinical trials an important goal? How do we work to detect heterogeneity? And how do we interpret it when we see it? Uh, let me then begin in the interest of time by only briefly introducing each of the six panelists that we're gonna hear from and refer you to the uh, a bio book that I believe was provided online for everyone. Um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce our first panelist, Donna Cryer is the founder and chief, chief executive officer of the Global Clinical Institute. The, it's the only patient-driven liver health nonprofit uh, operating in the US and in Europe. Donna? Hello, um, it's a pleasure to be um, talking with you today uh, on this very important topic. It is always a challenge to follow uh, Dr. Califf um, uh, one I am, am very familiar with, so hopefully I will, um, I will do uh, as, as well. Um, so uh, we've asked uh, several really daunting questions, very important questions already today. Um, and so I'm really going to take just one of them. Um, and that is, and we can go to the next slide. Um, as we talk about, is this safe and effective for me? Who am I? Um, and so as we attempt to establish these uniform standards for defining racial and ethnic groups, how really good at that are we? And do our current ways of doing so, our current methods, 
um, are, do they meet the times? Do they meet the moments? Do they meet the complexities uh, that Dr. Califf and others have spoken to? Um, I would suggest in my short time with you this morning that, that they do not. Um, so if, if our, the question that we're asking is, uh, what groupings of people yield sufficient numbers to meet endpoints of trials with statistical significance and sufficiently similar so the outcomes are meaningful, but sufficiently diverse so they justify a broad label and confidence in the generalizability of, of results? Basically, that question is, do I believe that uh, a medication emerging from a clinical research process will work in someone like me? Um, and then uh, is our study population uh, sufficiently diverse to identify other effects, questions, and potential benefits? In other words, is the um, child population so homogeneous, are we so narrowly focused on the uh, defined endpoint that it leaves out the opportunity of finding out uh, other things. So if we go to the next slide. Um, when we think about uh, traditional US uh, racial and ethnic classifications, I would submit that they increasingly uh, fail to serve us, not only in the US, um, but certainly when we try to apply that to global populations. Um, and that's due certainly to a host of social and legal factors, the constructs of what makes someone black uh, in the United States are very different legal con and social constructs of what white might make someone uh, black or colored in, in other countries. Um, and those have real effects when you start making uh, clinical decisions um, or doing drug development on top of those social and legal factors and uh, assuming that they are sound or, or meaningful. Um, you know, one, one question uh, as we think about uh, phenotypes, so um, who is black? So I'm black presumab uh, pres uh, presumably, um, although I'm more than a third Scottish. So does the medication work for the West African part of me or the Scottish part of me? Uh, Barack Obama is uh, you know, famously biracial, white and black, um, white and African. Um, our president-elect to be is of uh, Jamaican and, uh, and Indian descent. And yet we're all uh, in a snapshot lumped up under black, but does that, um, does that convey uh, meaningful information in the way that we intend? Uh, two interesting examples, I think, that illustrate uh, this point that I wanted to um, bring to the group is uh, the fascinating fact, is, I find it fascinating, that um, in the most recent election in Brazil in November, uh, 42, thousand candidates um, were running of members of different races. Uh, but 36 percent um, change from white to brown, 30 percent change from brown to white, and uh, 22 percent change from brown to black. Um, and so uh, it was a, it's a preference. Some of them, you know, changed, changed back. Um, and so with that type of um, racial and ethnic fluidity, how can we assured, be assured that the categories that we use have a soundness and a meaning to them that will convey throughout the research process? And can we do better? Um, I also uh, uh, point to, um, terminology, perception um, uh, that we saw in Florida most, most recently, where issues of identification um, and may have uh, confounded uh, the pollsters uh, in predicting uh, who would vote for whom based on heritage. Um, uh, Latinx is a new term, uh, only 3% of people of, of 
Latin descent actually use it themselves. Um, it seems to be more of a, an academic and activist uh, circle. Um, and, and we saw that uh, many in, in certain counties in Florida, um, knowledge, um, uh, saw them that would rather be counted as white than black. Um, and, and that really didn't, the phenotype or their uh, color of the individual was not uh, the ter determinant factor. So our term in Tom Renologies um, were not quite matching people's self-perception. And if we are relying on that self-perception and that self-reporting for people um, in clinical trials, um, we may have some work to do. Um, next slide, please. So an example in, in liver disease, uh, less deconstructing what it means to be black or what it means to be uh, Latino, but what it means to be white. Uh, in, uh, in the world where I live most frequently, um, in NASH, which is a serious global disease affecting 148 people, we're really coming to realize that it's actually um, many different subtypes. One of the confounding um, factors in that, as we look at the data, um, are that many different nationalities and ethnicities are, are lumped together as white. So are all Egyptians or citizens of, of the United Arab Emirates where we know NASH is prevalent? Are they white? Um, are they experiencing NASH in the same way? I think the way that we collect data is confounding. The same with uh, Asians um, of different uh, countries and ethnicities. So next slide, please. Possible solutions? Uh, well, I think this conference uh, is all about uh, solutions. And so I think that um, two here, um, just to start, because I, I never like to leave with just problems without any solutions. Um, looking at people based on their genetic profiles, um, rather than their, their phenotypes or appearances or even their, their self-selected uh, identity, um, it may be more accurate and potentially more consistent across geographic uh, boundaries, giving us more applicable data. And that might carry over to um, and create more uh, useful international categories um, for our US trials as well. Thank you so much. My last slide. Okay. Terrific. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Donna. Um, I, I'll remind everyone, we, we will take questions if we have time at the very end. And you, as uh, uh, Sardep said originally, uh, you ought to post your questions in the Q&A uh, room. Our next speaker is Danielle Campbell. Uh, Danielle is a member of the faculty of the Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science in the Department of Preventative and Social Medicine and a research analyst at the University of California, Los Angeles. Danielle is a sociobehavioral scientist and a public health strategist. It's a pleasure to have you, Danielle. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to express my sincerest thanks to the organizers of this conference for allowing me the opportunity to be with you all today. Um, I bring you greetings, early greetings from the West Coast. Um, my talk is titled, A Case for Meaningful Inclusion of Women in HIV Clinical Research Trials. And in making the case for the continued need for inclusion of diverse populations, I'd like to first go to the next slide and draw your attention to the figure on the screen. If you're familiar with this public health paradigm and what it represents in terms of health equity and social justice, then the figure on the screen is not lost on you. For those who are not familiar with, with this image, it is a graphic representation of a term we call equity. It'll be hotly discussed and widely debated over the next three days, but to, I'll remind you that more simply stated, it's represented in the figure that you see. Behind a fence stand three figures of differing height, all watching a baseball game. On the left, our current reality. Difference in access to different populations who could all potentially benefit if only they had equal access to see over that fence. And the next frame, equality. Each individual is in fact given equal access. However, they each don't have quite they each don't quite have access as evidenced by the person on the far, the far right who still can't manage to see over that gate. Then 
we have equity. The scales are balanced and each individual is positioned to be able to see over that fence. And in the final frame, a concept from times once had, liberation, no fence. Can you imagine a world with no fence and equal access of benefit for all? Please bear this in mind as we discuss the lack of access and meaningful inclusion of women in HIV related clinical trials. And I know that some of the, this, the focus of discussions here today are uh, on the US context. However, given HIV is a global, is, a, is a, um, a disease that affects us globally, my talk will partially address that global influence on women's in meaningful inclusion and enrollment in HIV cl related clinical research. Next slide. So just a bit of, of context here. Uh, the global overall burden is 3.36.9 million people living with HIV, uh, 870,000 new infections per year. That's three women every four minutes. By the end of this talk, between 18 and 22 women will have been newly diagnosed with HIV. Globally, each week, close to 7,000 new infections are diagnosed amongst women ages 15 to 24. And given this stark reality, one would expect relatively comparable reflectiveness of women amongst participants enrolled in HIV-related clinical research trials. Instead, what we see is a consistent low enrollment of women in clinical trials being conducted by the largest stage funded HIV treatment research network. Next slide. So the impetus of my talk today on the left, a representation of the global burden of HIV in women. On the right, the consistent under or low enrollment of women in HIV clinical research. And so when you put into context what that means in terms of the effects of treatment and the heterogeneity of research populations that participate in clinical research trials, there is in fact a representational discord. So as part of my advocacy for the meaningful inclusion of women in HIV related research, myself and others have asked that agencies, both federal and non-governmental, follow the spirit of the 1993 NIH Revitalization Act and subsequent policies aimed at the equitable inclusion of diverse populations. Next slide. So a bit of background, the enrollment of women in ACT trials and clinical trials generally has been a concern for, of women and allies for our decades. I discussed briefly about the, um, the formidable policy that references investigators and directs them to uh, equitably and meaningfully include women and other rep underrepresented populations that could benefit from access to potential treatments and participation in research to be included in trials. However, what we see graphically represented in the previous trial is in fact not the case. Next slide. So a bit on enrollment of women in clinical trials. It's been, uh, the history of women's participation has been one fraught with challenge. If we go as early here as 1977, the FDA excludes women of, of childbearing potential from trials. In the 1990s, we did make some headway with the Revitalization Act uh, that's then uh, curbed in the 90s and 2000s with um, discussions around sex differences in HIV pathogenesis, given what we know demonstrated in the results of some of the trials. That paved the way in 2006 for the Gray Study, which enrolled a substantive amount of women. Next slide. So represented on the slide here, thank you. We have um, a representation of the burden of women's representation in HIV clinical trials. As you see on the left, we have the substantive burden here in women in pink and in men in blue. However, our participation in our trials is substantively low. In comparison to men, it's you know um, less equitable in vaccine trials. It's almost abysmal in cure trials and potentially negligible in uh, latency reverse, reversing agency trials. So clinical trials have demonstrated sex-based differences and variations in HIV pathogenesis and natural history in untreated HIV with antiretroviral treatment and HIV reservoirs and persistence, and most importantly, HIV cure research. 
So why don't we have equitable representation of women in clinical trials? Next slide. That's the prevailing question. So highlighting women's efforts is the easiest request to satisfy. Sex-specific objectives should continue to not only challenge, but um, should not only challenge investigators, but it should be a form of reciprocity and equity to include women in clinical trials. And most importantly, we as a community remain enthusiastic about this effort and will most certainly not give up. Next slide. So moving forward, we have a few, well, I've outlined a few policy analysis, research and innovation suggestions or strategies that could be employed. So enrollment goals by sex and gender as part of the formation of the clinical research, reporting sex and gender of participants, stratified and disaggregated analyses where possible, investigation of sex-based differences in vitro, and reporting sex in animal and cell-based model systems. And so in terms of innovation, we'd like to validate surrogates to estimate efficacy across population, and most certainly the meaningful inclusion of, of uh, pregnant and breastfeeding women in clinical trials. Next slide. So just from the realm of HIV cure, um, I'd like to just really round out the discussion by addressing some of the limitations on feasibility. There was a 2019 landscape analysis conducted and it demonstrated that only 16.7% of enrolled participants indicated a female sex. And when you juxtapose that to the abject situation of the HIV epidemic, this um, should give you pause for concern, just given that if and when a cure is um, ascertained, will it in fact work in the bodies of women who bear the brunt of HIV infection? Next slide. So where we must go, we must consider the lived reality of women and girls who could, again, potentially benefit not only from participation in HIV cure related research and other clinical trials. Next slide. So just a few messages of hope as I close out. Women must be prioritized as participants in HIV research, most importantly, HIV cure research. Studies should continue to explore sex differences in research participants, and the global community must continue to advocate for the meaningful inclusion of women as defined by women in clinical research. Next slide. And so I'll close out with an image that reminds me um, of the women whose shoulders I stand on as I present for, for this group today. Thank you all for your time, and I look forward to addressing any questions. Thanks so much, Danielle. We're gonna move on uh, this morning. Uh, our next talk, a uh, brief for demographic diversity and randomized clinical trials from Janet Witz, who is, who's founded the Statistics Collaborative in 1990. She's a fellow of the American Statistical Association, the Society for Clinical Trials, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Pleasure to have you, Janet. Sorry. Sorry, I was on mute and my video wasn't working. So thanks, David, and thanks, Barbara, and the whole group for putting this meeting together. I think we're going to learn a tremendous amount. Um, my yeah. video, yeah, my video is not, can you hear me? We can hear you, we can't see you. Yeah, yeah the video is not working, I don't know why. Um, so yeah. what I'd like to do is say a little bit about uh, demographic diversity. I'm thinking, and in fact, by demographic, I'm thinking of, oh, I'm not ready yet, but okay. Um, variables like gender, sex, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, uh, religious background, and so forth. And to a lesser extent, age. Much of what I will say have been already said in different words by the previous speakers, and I'm sure will be said in other different words by the next. Uh, next slide, please. So here's the population. The population that would use a medical product is demographically diverse, and this is the US. Um, if we go, as Barbara said, if we go to a global trial, we have even more diversity, even more demographic diversity, and diversity in other measures as well. Next slide, please. 
very often when we're dealing with the, with studies, we exclude uh, pediatric studies. So, the, so we look at the adults, and we often don't include the very elderly, although I don't think of that age as very elderly anymore. Um, next, next slide, please. So actually, go back. If we think of polls, of, like in the last election, had, that, had the pollsters been much more careful and precise about looking at these different demographic groups, maybe they would have gotten the polls better. Maybe their prediction would have been better. Next slide. Um, but in medical interventions, in contrast to polling and political questions, we assume to a first approximation, or we have assumed in the past to a first approximation, that the treatment effect is the same on some scale in all groups. Now, you know, Rob pointed out that from a clinical point of view, we often are more interested in the absolute difference than in the relative difference. But in the assumptions designing trials, we usually are assuming, or we're often assuming, relative constancy. Now, we know that this assumption of homogeneity um, is, is not really true, but it allows us to design a trial. Next slide, please. This picture shows the effect, shows the effect of treatment in different subgroups. What this picture is, is, is uh, Bob Byington made this many years ago. He took every subgroup, every demographic, I'm sorry, every baseline subgroup in the SHEP trial, the systolic hypertension, the elderly program, looked at each one and asked, what do we see, what effect do we see in that subgroup? Uh, the overall relative risk, i.e. the benefit of antihypertensive treatment in those with systolic hypertension um, on fatal and non-fatal fatal cardiovascular disease events was a relative risk of 0.69, roughly a 30% benefit. And you see that in the blue, those very top, those, those very large subgroups, they all huddled, huddled around the point estimate of 0.69. The moderate sized subgroups, the one in red, all showed there was much, there was more variability, but they all showed benefits, some bigger benefits, some less benefit, but also benefit. When you got to the little subgroups, the ones in green, the variability was huge. Now, one could say, aha, that's because the biology is different. But I think the more parsimonious explanation is that when subgroups get very small, the variability in the, in the results are very large. And so when you see a small subgroup with a very large effect in either direction, you need to be suspicious that this may be just noise. Next slide, please. And so here, here's a picture of a um, forest plot. The underlying assumption in, in most trials that the effect size is approximately the same in all subgroups. And we know that the play of chance will, approve, will produce apparent differences among them. So the lesson is we must be skeptical when we see apparent differences. Apparent differences that were not that hypothesized and not thought through up front. Next slide. So if we assume that there are no differences among subgroups, and if we dismiss differences when we see them, why bother to aim for diversity? Next, please. I think there are at least three different reasons for, for aiming for diversity, and they're quite different from each other. One is that our assumption about homogeneity of effect size in a heterogeneous population may be a little bit wrong. And in that case, the homogeneity that we have assumed 
will fail to estimate the variability of effect size correctly. So we'll be a little bit off. Next slide, please. But more worrisome, our assumptions may be very wrong. And I think that's what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the today and tomorrow. The failure to, to include diverse groups means we have no window into our assumptions of homogeneity. So we have this balance between we want to, to make inferences that are sensible to the various multivariate conditions who we, people who we are, but we need to make be very cautious about inferring differences, especially when our subgroups are quite small. Next, please. But the third reason is distributive justice. Next slide. What is that? It concerns the equitable distribution of scarce resources among all socioeconomic groups and population sectors. Next slide. And here's something from the National Academies in, that's relevant to us today and tomorrow. In the context of clinical studies, fair allocation is best characterized as equity. And remember that word equity used by Danielle yes, uh, just before me. And, and the quote goes on, that is, because research carries both benefits and burdens, fairness requires that no one group gender, racial, ethnic, or socioeconomic group receive disproportionate benefits or bear disproportionate, bur disproportionate burdens of research. And with that, I hope we will all do what we can for diversity and to learn what we can about the differences in treatment effect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Janet, and I believe I may have mispronounced your name earlier. It's Wittis, not Wittis. Yes. Uh, forgive me for that. Um, and, and, and thanks again. I think Janet underscored sort of the, the primary or two pronged issues that we talked about, which are really about both uh, equity and, and about science in, in thinking about diversity and inclusion. Um, let me move on. And uh, our next speaker is uh, Christopher Granger. Dr. Granger is a professor of medicine in the Division of Cardiology at Duke University and director of the Cardiac Care Unit for the Duke University Medical Center. Uh, pleasure to welcome you, uh, Dr. Granger. Great, thank you, David. Um, and it's a, it's a real pleasure to be part of this, um, um, part of this um, symposium. And um, I'm going to skip over my first couple of slides, which have been so well covered by Barbara and Rob and Janet, and um, start with a and start with a couple of um, of uh, case examples where uh, some of these issues have really been, I think, nicely highlighted, including how we address the issue of um, of regional or geographic heterogeneity, which includes differences in genetics and um, race and ethnicity of populations, as well as treatments that. Um, uh, that, that patients get in these um, different um, geographic regions. And a nice example, I think, was the PLATO trial. This was a um, uh, 19,000 patient um, trial conducted in 43 countries um, comparing ticagrelor to clopidogrel in patients with acute coronary syndromes. And there was a highly significant um, benefit on reducing cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke with ticagrelor. And um, I think there were 34 pre-specified subgroups, and a couple of them were borderline statistically significant. But, uh, but kind of following a variant of Murphy's Law, the one that really caught people's attention, largely because the FDA is especially responsible for the U.S. population, is that clopidogrel turned out to be favorable in terms of its effect in the United States, and there was a fairly statistically significant um, interaction here. And so this created a problem because um, of the 34 countries or the, the um, 43 countries involved, um, this was the one that would be the most problematic from the US perspective, um, uh, from the FDA perspective. 
And um, uh, I think most people believe that this was likely due to the play of chance that, that Ticagrelor should work in US population, which is so um, fundamentally similar to, to, um, to kind of European population, for example. Um, and so a variety of analyses were done. And the one that seemed to provide the most credible explanation, if in fact this interaction was real, was that higher dose aspirin was used more routinely in the United States. And the association with use of higher dose aspirin, both at baseline and even more complicated um, treatment after randomization with higher dose aspirin, um, seems to be a, an explan a possible explanation of the um, difference um, in, the, um, uh, in the outcomes according to region. Next slide just shows this, and in fact, this was showed at the FDA in reviewing, and it's in the package insert, and it just shows that in um, uh, North America and um, also in the US, um, there is this um, um, apparent um, difference in treatment effect. Next slide. And then with a, a large number of analyses that supported the idea that it might be related to the aspirin, um, in the package insert, the FDA um, and AstraZeneca placed this statement that maintenance, maintenance doses of aspirin above 100 milligrams reduce the effectiveness of Berlinta and should be avoided. And uh, there were also, though, I think appropriate comments that this may or may not have been the case. It could also have been the play of chance, but nonetheless, this was a... a a, a, a mitigating um, approach to in, in case this was a uh, um, this was a factor. Next slide. And a, a, another um, example addressing this question of you know will it work for me with respect to to um, um, racial, ethnic, and other um, uh, diversity is the issue of safety and in. Asia, especially East Asia, there's been a concern amongst the clinical community that there's a higher risk for bleeding with anti-thrombotic and anticoagulation um, therapy. And so we've looked at this in some of the trials of anticoagulants in atrial fibrillation. And the next slide um, shows some of the analyses for the most feared and severe bleeding complication, intracranial hemorrhage. And in fact, the single most important predictor in multivariable modeling was being in Asia for risk of intracranial hemorrhage. And uh, there were questions about, was this a particular issue with warfarin? It seemed as though it might be compared to the NOAC drugs, the um, non-vitamin K oral anticoagulants. And the next slide um, has some additional analyses from the Aristotle trial. This is warfarin versus apixaban showing that there was about threefold higher risk of intracranial hemorrhage with warfarin in East Asia um, compared with um, outside of East Asia, um, and that um, apixaban seemed to be associated with a substantial reduction in this risk. And then the next slide um, addressed this by the, the appropriate question, okay, here's a single trial, can that be replicated in terms of a finding in a population, and in fact, it was in each of the trials that compared that, that studied warfarin um, as a comparator versus NOAX. Um, there was a substantially higher risk of intracranial hemorrhage in Asia versus not in Asia. But of course, this also could be a non-warfarin specific issue. And so, the next slide shows the the same um, relative risk increase with the NOACs um, in Asia versus um, outside of Asia. And what we see is that, that there is also a higher risk there, but it's, it's only about half of the degree of increased risk, which I think does um, support the concept that warfarin may be particularly problematic um, in Asia, in East Asia. Now, what we don't know is, is, that a, is that true if people from East Asia who are not in East Asia, for example, in the United States. And we simply don't have enough um, um, patients um, in outside of East Asia to be able to clearly define this. Next slide. So in summary then, 
the most common cause of different treatment effects in subpopulations in these trials is the play of chance, and the human mind is prone to overinterpret these um, binary um, findings. Um, few trials are designed or powered to define um, heterogeneous effects in subgroups, but the paradox is we still know that we, as Janet so nicely um, um, outlined, that we need to include these diverse populations in diverse typical care settings and at least assess for consistency, but only believe the heterogeneity when it's plausible has external consistency um, and is replicated. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, and we'll move along. Our next speaker is uh, Alice Unger. Uh, and uh, Dr. Unger is uh, also a cardiologist and director of the Office of Drug Evaluation, uh, the Office of New Drugs, and uh, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the US FDA. Uh, Dr. Unger. Thank you very much, David. Um, can people hear me? Yes. Good, thank you. All right, I'd like to thank the organizers of, of this symposium for inviting me to be here. I think um, the uh, issue of subgroup analyses and how to uh, plan, how to interpret is, uh, is really uh, important. And uh, I'm really glad um, this symposium is taking place. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, we have a responsibility to enroll uh, broad and diverse groups of patients in clinical trials and we have an obligation to analyze them. And at the end of the day, the statement that uh, we all like to write, uh, whether we're a trialist or a drug company or a regulator, is something to the effect that if efficacy results were consistent across the subgroups based on patient demographics, yada, 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 and that makes all of us feel good. And, and sometimes it's true. Next slide. And so this is the uh, beloved forest plot, this one from uh, the Paradigm trial. Uh, which studied uh, cubitral valsartan for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Um, so sometimes this works out pretty well. Next slide. And you can see all the uh, blobs uh, aligning uh, well to the uh, left of the, uh, of the uh, zero uh, line there, or the, or the one line for the hazard ratio. And that makes all of us uh, feel good, uh, but it doesn't always work out that way. Next slide. Uh, sometimes you get this. Um, someone showed a similar slide. Actually, it may have been from this trial. So this is the same drug for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. This is the Paragon trial. Uh, and you can see uh, some of the uh, subgroups are not so uh, favorable. Um, first of all, the, uh, I should point out that the trial itself, uh, the uh, rate ratio did not exclude uh, uh, unity. Um, but you can see that for age and sex and, uh, and ejection fraction, there, there is um, some heterogeneity. Next slide. So what do we do? And I'll, I'll spend a few minutes talking about efficacy and also a few on safety. Next slide. And next slide. So there are some problems with interpretation of subgroup analyses for efficacy. And uh, I think uh, most of these have been mentioned already. Um, the studies are powered for the overall population, so you don't have power for subgroups of interest. Usually, you don't have adequate power for any of them. Um, rarely do we subject a subgroup uh, to hypothesis testing where we control the type 1 error rate. Um, people have noted uh, some variables are correlated, kidney function with age, et cetera. Um, sometimes you get small trials. We, we uh, talk about these large outcome trials where you have a lot of data. If you only have 100 patients in the trial overall, you have nothing, nothing in the subgroups, um, really. Um, many people are infatuated with point estimates um, is a problem. And uh, given the limited ends within the subgroups and the multiple subgroups examined, um, you have the multiplicity problem. And the most uh, likely reason you observe disparate treatment effects was because of chance. Next slide. So uh, when the results are similar across subgroups, then there's cause for celebration. And uh, we readily accept results that are consistent uh, with our beliefs. We like that. And people are infatuated with the point estimates and tend to ignore the confidence intervals. So whereas for the overall trial, uh, we demand that the confidence interval exclude a no treatment effect, um, for subgroups, obviously, we're, we're much more lenient. And if the point estimates are on the right side of the line, uh, then we're happy. 
Um, and we take the consistency of the point estimates as evidence of the treatment effect across all of them. But, you know, in general, we don't consider the confidence intervals. Um, that's, that's a bridge too far. Next slide. When you don't have consistency across the subgroups, you have the same issue, which is that people are often infatuated with the point estimates and they ignore the confidence intervals. So often the confidence intervals uh, will not exclude no treatment effect, um, in which case people can be uh, okay with the result. Um, if the subgroup is small and the confidence interval is wide, uh, most people would dismiss this as play of chance, uh, but sometimes there are reasons for concern and then some would ask for more data in the subgroup and such data may be impossible to obtain, at least in a conventional trial framework. If the subgroup is not small, then some people don't raise concerns. They just say, well, look, you know, subgroup analyses have limitations and we accept that and, and the results are reasonably homogeneous. Uh, but others raise concerns. Uh, they may cite some pathophysiologic rationale to explain the treatment difference, which in many cases you shouldn't believe. Uh, and they may believe that some type of action is warranted. So addressing the heterogeneity and labeling or obtaining additional data. Next slide. I will uh, make a few points and maybe this is what Rob Califf was referring to as uh, subgroup adequate. Um, so when you have a continuous parameter, uh, so often the continuous parameter is dichotomized. So we take something continuous like age and we divide it into, into two pieces. But age is continuous, and one could consider age in quartiles, quintiles, or model it as a continuous variable. And if you find a trend across a distribution of ages, it lends credibility to a subgroup finding. And conversely, the absence of a trend undercuts the credibility of a subgroup finding. Um, other sub, other uh, continuous variables are often needlessly dichotomized. You know, here are some examples. Um, also, ordinal variables like New York Heart Association functional class. Um, you can look uh, across the range of, of these parameters and see if you see a, a, a trend. And that helps convince you that the uh, finding is actually uh, drug related. Next slide. When you have a dichotomous parameter, obviously you don't have any wiggle room. So, uh, sex, uh, race, et cetera. Uh, Concomitant drug use is generally defined as a dichotomous variable, yes or no, but even that um, can be considered by dose, none lower or higher. So when you, when you have a finding in a subgroup and you're examining it, trying to figure out if it's credible, um, you, can, you can look across the range of, of values. Next slide. Um, a couple other things hint, uh, tend to uh, lend credibility to a uh, result. Obviously, if you uh, find uh, consistent subgroup uh, findings in two or more trials, that adds considerable credibility. Um, observation of inconsistent effects across subgroups uh, across two or more trials, then uh, conversely, that undercuts the validity of the findings. Next slide. There's so always supporting information. In, in, in a sense, I guess maybe we're all Bayesians. So the existence of a prior can support an observation in a subgroup. Um, so some drugs have sex-specific properties. Uh, sometimes there are interactions between a drug's uh, mechanism of action and a subgroup, um, maybe uh, a drug effect mediated by glucose handling, in which case effects in diabetic patients could differ from others. Next slide. I'd like to spend a, a minute or two talking about prospective plans for subgroup analyses. This is, this is my view. Um, there are three possibilities for subgroup analyses. First is that analyses are pre-specified with a prospective plan for inference testing. So there's a plan for control of the type 1 error rate. And, and this is unusual, but it is done on occasion. The most common situation is that analyses are pre-specified, but no hypothesis testing is planned. And then the third scenario is the analyses are not pre-specified and there's no hypothesis testing. Some people call this dredging. Next slide, please. Um, so what's the difference between one and two? Well, none, one and two is, is night and day. Um, with one, you're actually uh, controlling the type one error rate and in two, you're not. Um, and um, if you control the type one error rate, then you can actually provide substantial evidence of an effect in a subgroup. Um, but number two is exploratory, and I think we all uh, recognize that. Next slide. 
Now let's compare number two and number three. Some people might disagree with me on this, but what's the difference between pre-specifying uh, subgroup analysis and not pre-specifying it? Well, in neither case are you testing a hypothesis, okay? I would say that both of these are exploratory. Um, a company uh, plans subgroup analyses. They plan some because maybe they have a theory that the drug will be more or less effective in a subgroup. And they plan countless others because they know they have to look. They may not think there's going to be a difference between above and below 65, but they know they have to look. So that's pre-specified. They may have a legitimate concern about diabetics and non-diabetics, so they put that in. But <clears throat> by pre-specifying it, um, they're, they're not really very far ahead of not pre-specifying it because in, in both cases, whatever they find, whatever you find, um, is exploratory. So the critical issue is really the, whether there's a prospectively planned test of hypothesis with control of the type one error rate. And just to drive the point home, a company could pre-specify 100 different uh, subgroup analyses. It, it doesn't matter. Okay, next slide. So let's talk for a second about safety. Next slide, a minute. <laughs> okay, so this is really thorny. So in efficacy analyses, all patients contribute data, whether the endpoint is continuous, ordinal, dichotomous, whatever. Um, and so the subgroups include all patients that meet the definition of the subset. So if 20% of patients are greater than 65 years old, then 20% of the participants are included in that subset. Um, but it's a different deal for safety analyses because only patients with the adverse reaction of interest contribute data. So the ends here are doubly limited. So if an adverse reaction occurs in 20% of patients and 20% of patients are over 65, then 20 times 20 is 4% of patients are contributing data in that subgroup. So you really have a hard time uh, in terms of uh, analyzing uh, subgroup data for safety. Next slide. Um, but well, what's the goal? Well, the goal is to provide reasonable advice for labeling if you can. Um, and the interpretation of these data requires some judgment. We try not to go beyond the data. Uh, and all the issues that I just described with respect to subgroup analyses for efficacy are also applicable to safety. Next slide, please. Uh, Rob Califf mentioned this, and I think it's a really critical point, which is that we care way more about the absolute risk than we do about the relative risk. So let's consider drug Z versus placebo with an adverse reaction of falls. And there's plausibility here because the drug decreases blood pressure, especially when standing, so people can fall. Okay, so the overall relative risk is 2.0, you see in this uh, table here. And overall here, one-tenth of the population is 65 and older. So you have 1,000 patients overall, and 100 are, are over the age of 65. Um, so the relative risk is consistent with respect to age, and we shouldn't have any concerns, right? Probably we shouldn't. Next slide. I've added a column here, which gets at the uh, rel excuse me, which gets at the absolute risk, which is what really matters. So older patients have more falls, and this is true in both treatment groups. So in patients over 65, the relative risk is two, but the absolute risk difference is six percent. You subtract. The, uh, the two numbers. And that may merit mention in labeling. In other words, hey, the drug lowers blood pressure, be vigilant about falls, especially in the elderly. So that's good advice, um, but that's because we kept our eye on the absolute risk here and not just the relative risk. Next slide. So I have a summary slide here, which is that subgroup analyses are important. They're not going away. There are clues beyond the forest plot that can aid in interpretation of subgroup findings. Uh, typically with limited numbers of patients in subgroups, multiplicity and lack of formal hypothesis testing, these analyses are exploratory, whether pre-planned or not, I would say. One has to be careful not to overinterpret. And for safety analyses across subgroups, consider both relative risks and absolute risk differences. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Dr. Unger. I'm going to move on uh, quickly, if we can. Our, our, our final panelist this morning is Aloka Chakravarti. And Dr. Chakravarti is the Deputy Director of the Office of Biostatistics and the Office of Translational Sciences um, at CIDR. 
uh, at the FDA. She's been at CIDR since 1992, and it's a great pleasure to have her here and uh, uh, wrapping up this morning uh, panel. Hello. Good morning. Can you hear me right? Yes. Thank you, David, and thank you to the organizers. I'll spend a few minutes talking about drug trial snapshots, which uh, provide some uh, amount of data transparency of what we look at uh, for drug evaluation. Next slide, please. So the FDA Safety and Innovation Act of 2012 uh, provided in the section 907 the drug trial snapshots will provide the consumers and the healthcare professionals with information about who participated in the clinical trials. And it talks about the inclusion of safety and effectiveness data by demographic subgroups such as sex, age, race, and ethnicity. This is a part of the overall FDA effort to make demographic data available in one location and accessible to the patients this talks about how the studies were designed, where the trials are conducted, and any differences in the benefits and side effects among the different demographic groups. It also provides uh, some discussion on the recommendation for improving the completeness and the quality of the analysis of the data. Um, Dr. Hanberg, who was the commissioner at that time, mentioned that when a more diverse population participates in clinical trials, we increase the potential to know more about the extent to which different subgroups, males and females, young and old, people of various racial and ethnic backgrounds, and patients with different comorbid disease and conditions might respond to a medical product. And um, I have included here URL to um, the drug trial snapshots page at FDA. Next slide, please. So drug trial snapshots or DTS uh, provide questions about adequate and equal inclusion of women and people of racial minority groups in clinical trials because stakeholders want FDA to require sponsors to include a certain percentage of demographic subgroups and analyze the subgroup data by uh, sex, race, and age. In August 2014, FDA released an action plan to enhance the collection and availability of demographic subgroup data. And the priority of this report was to make demographic data more available and transparent. CEDAR released DTS to outline the participation of people in the clinical trial by sex, age, and race, and highlighted the information in easy to read format. In the CEDAR uh, conversation that I have uh, provided a link to, um, there was mentioned that people can actually go to a snapshot on our website and see the number and type of men and women who have been involved in clinical trials. They can see how many African-Americans uh, Hispanics or Asians were involved, how many people participated above or below a certain range and other demographic data. Next slide, please. So one thing to mention is that snapshots are not package inserts because DTS is in, intended for public and it's written in a consumer friendly language. It focuses on the subgroup data and analysis. Package insert, on the other hand, is intended for physicians and it talks in technical language and provides comprehensive resource for drug information. Uh, DTS provides links to the package inserts and reviews in the drugs at FDA and it's published uh, very soon after the drug approval. Package insert, on the other hand, is uh, not linked to the reviews and it's finalized with the drug approval. Um, in the DTS, the subgroup analysis, interpretations, and the conclusions are provided by 
are done and provided by FDA. The package insert is negotiated between the FDA and the sponsor. Next slide. So let me uh, focus on a few statistical issues. This is just the beginning of the discussion because in the later um, sections and later sessions of this, we will have opportunity to hear much more on the statistical issues. The first that many of the prior speakers have mentioned on the small sample sizes in the subgroup. So it brings about the question of preserving anonymity. It also brings the question of distributional approximations because how good are the coverages of the confidence intervals and the credible interval? The next one is, this is definitely a multidisciplinary approach. Um, and the efficacy and safety subgroup analysis is always done with clinical input and other um, scientific input. The best subsets for age and any other factors are discussed because they may be effect modifiers, which studies to include, and whether the results should be integrated across the studies. I'll talk about that in a minute as well. The question is why combine results across the studies? Of course, the first one is to enhance the statistical power. And it also enhances the readability to provide a single message. Next slide, please. There are many considerations uh, when we think about uh, the trials to integrate. First of all, look into the confirmatory studies that were used for the regulatory decision. And these studies should be relatively similar in design analysis and results. Here, um, the clinical input is very important. And um, the importance is also in the design and analysis. And representative study is chosen if the results differ. In the snapshot, the document, the trial similarities in the graphs and the tables. Detailed evaluation of similarity is done in terms of the target population, the treatment arms, add-ons, comparators, uh, blinding, the medications that were allowed and not allowed, the endpoint definition when the patients were evaluated, handling of concurrent events, uh, different uh, disposition factors such as uh, the percentage discontinued due to adverse events, and the best statistical approach, including um, stratifying analysis by study. Next slide, please. So, um, I go into a few um, final uh, thoughts. DTS provides an important first step to data transparency. Will this drug work for me? And who looked like me in the clinical trial? Um, the first two panelists brought this up very nicely. And this is also a very important piece that we look at FDA. Um, caution against over-interpreting the subgroup results, um, just as Ellis mentioned a minute ago. There's, of course, room for innovative statistical methodology, um, for example, borrowing information across subgroups uh, by various Bayesian methods. Um, this is important, and multidisciplinary uh, collaboration is critical. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aloka. And I want to give my thanks to all six panelists for uh, my, getting us off to a, a really uh, wonderful morning session. Um, in the interest of time, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to take any questions. I think everybody deserves a break. Uh, we will take a brief break. We'd like to resume for the next pan, uh, the next presentation by Steve Snappen at 10.30. So uh, please, uh, you can leave the 
uh, yourself connected, but uh, give yourself a six minute break at this point and rejoin us at 1030. Thank you so much. And again, thanks to the panel.
Are we ready to begin again? Are we ready to begin again? Yep. Great. Um, so uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Scott Evans, who will be talking about subgroup identification, utility, impact, and methods. Um, this is perhaps a slightly more technical uh, uh, conversation, but he promises to make it available for even the proletariat like myself. So with that, Scott. Scott, we can't hear you. Um, and I'm not sure if you're sh planning on showing your own slides. Or whether he's back from break. <laughs> well, we'll give him a minute. Um, Barbara, what, um, Stuart Pocock here, what happened to um, Steve Snappin's talk? Um, is he not ready at the moment? Um, we could do, Scott was going to go first. Steve, do you want to go instead? Uh, I am ready to go, if you're ready. We're ready. Can, um, or we're doing your slides, so why don't you just advance to, are you doing your own slides or we're doing them, right? Uh, I think that you're doing them. Yeah, so... Um, Hyatt will just advance to Steve's slides. Thank you. And Steve, I want to say to the audience that Steve was really, uh, uh, these are Scott's slides. I would go off and uh, find yeah, them. Scott so, is here. Um, can you hear oh, me? Oh, right? good. Sorry. Good. Um, and uh, it doesn't matter to me who goes first. I thought Steve was going, but um, either one is all right with me. Which do you, Steve, what's your preference? Um, so if Hyatt has found my first slide, then why don't we just go ahead and do that? Okay. Um, so I wanna thank Steve for um, not only giving this presentation today, but for being such an, a valuable member of the uh, working group that came up with the diversity document. The statistics section would never have read as brilliantly and as clearly as it did were it not for Steve's every intervention. And in fact, this, um, this conference is very much a tribute to his uh, vision of uh, advancing the topic of subgroup analysis. Um, Steve? Uh, well, that's uh, very kind. Thank you, Barbara. Um, so in this presentation, um, I'm going to continue. Um, as I, I see this as more of a setting the stage for the discussion that will follow over the next uh, day or two uh, in this conference. So um, the next slide, I'll start with just some very basic uh, introduction to subgroup analyses, which I'm sure all of you are very familiar with. Uh, of course, as we know, clinical trials are designed primarily to evaluate treatment effects in the population as a whole. Uh, but it's, of course, important to know whether the effects are consistent uh, across multiple patient characteristics, and we refer to inconsistency as heterogeneity of treatment effects, or HTE, um, which of course is how the, this conference is named. Uh, now, to address the question, um, analyses of clinical trials typically include a set of subgroup analyses uh, or separate evaluations within subgroups defined by these characteristics. Uh, now, in my presentation, and I think in most, it, when most people talk about the subgroup problem, they are talking about 
baseline characteristics to define the subgroups. Um, it is sometimes done uh, that uh, there are post-randomization characteristics uh, that are used to define subgroups, but that's generally considered not a valid thing to do. So we'll consider here uh, baseline characteristics. Uh, now, sometimes there are pre-specified hypotheses with respect to um, uh, heterogeneity of pre treatment effect across uh, subgroups, but the focus here uh, and for this conference in general is on exploratory subgroup analyses, which I'll define as those where there's no pre-specified hypothesis. That is, we're just looking across a whole set of subgroup, uh, a whole set of subgroups, uh, not expecting to find any difference, but reacting when we do find differences. Uh, and I also recognize this term, exploratory subgroup analyses, may not be uh, used in the same way by everyone. But anyway, this is how I'm defining it here. Okay, next slide. So um, if you didn't know before, you know by now that the subgroup problem is difficult. Um, now, good news is that analyses within subgroups are valid and they provide unbiased estimates of treatment effect. And that's true regardless of whether or not uh, the randomization has been stratified by the, uh, by the subgroup factor. Uh, so uh, randomization guarantees that you have valid analyses within subgroups. The problem, though, is that the play of chance frequently causes apparent heterogeneity when none truly exists. Now, this was uh, brilliantly illustrated um, by a subgroup analysis of the ISIS-2 trial, brilliantly illustrated by, um, uh, by Richard Pito. Um, and uh, Dr. Califf mentioned uh, this um, this example earlier, um, uh, and uh, but um, I think what it, it this raises the issue that re the real problem comes when we focus on extreme estimates. That is, we look at a whole set of subgroup results, and our eyes take us to the most extreme ones, the cases where the treatment effect appears to be particularly large or particularly small. And it's when you focus on these extreme estimates that you get what's sometimes called random high bias, which is something very closely related to regression to the mean. Uh, and we know that many cases where uh, apparent heterogeneity of treatment effect has been followed up with additional studies, they failed to replicate uh, the, the issue. Uh, and so it's because of this problem that it's um, led people to come to a conclusion, which I think is summarized very nicely by the title of a paper by the late Peter Slight, which was uh, subgroup analyses in clinical trials, fun to look at, but don't believe them. Well, it would be nice if we could simply take that attitude that we don't believe them, but the problem is that real heterogeneity of treatment effect does exist, does exist commonly, and uh, uh, Barbara Beerer made this point in her presentation, uh, and it's important to detect it, but it can be swamped and probably is very often swamped by multiple instances of spurious heterogeneity. And the problem is trying to distinguish between those two things. Next slide. I have a, a few examples to, uh, to go through and we've seen many examples. I'll add a couple more. Uh, one uh, which got a lot of attention for, uh, for uh, heterogeneity was the merit heart failure trial, which was an evaluation of the beta, beta blocker metoprolol against placebo in patients with heart failure. Uh, what's um, interesting about this paper uh, is that there was actually a subsequent publication focused uh, specifically on the heterogeneity uh, uh, across countries uh, in this particular trial. And uh, so what you'll see here, there are the three forest plots corresponding to three different endpoints of the trial. And it was the red highlighted subgroup that got a lot of attention. And that is with the total mortality endpoint, the overall treatment effect was favorable, uh, but in the United States, there was no evidence of a treatment benefit. And the United States was uh, the largest country or the country with the most, the largest sample size in the trial. And so that lack of effect within the United States got a lot of attention. And I'll come back to this example in um, a later slide. 
Uh, next, uh, next example I had was the Plato trial, but uh, um, uh, Dr. Granger gave a very nice explanation of this one, and so I won't go into this one in any more detail, and we'll skip then to the next slide, uh, which was um, the, the trial called LIFE, uh, which was an evaluation of two antihypertensive regimens, losartan, uh, which was the experimental regimen versus atenolol in patients with left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, this is an example near and dear to my heart because I was the statistician for this trial uh, back uh, uh, while I was working at Merck. And uh, interesting, one of the interesting findings of this trial was an apparent um, interaction with race and heterogeneity of treatment effect. Uh, and uh, there was a pre-specified uh, grouping of race, but this was a, a, in a post hoc grouping, if you put together all of the non-black racial groups, uh, you got a treatment effect which significantly favored uh, losartan, uh, but looking solely at the black patients, the results significantly favored atenolol. Uh, this is actually the only case that I'm aware of, uh, of an interaction where the, um, the confidence intervals uh, in, are in opposite directions and both entirely exclude unity. Okay, hey, next example, uh, next slide, rather. So um, the traditional frequentist approach to handling subgroups, I think, is very poorly suited to this problem. Uh, so what are the frequentist approaches one could use? Well, first, uh, one thing you could do is statistical testing within every single subgroup. Now, that's not a recommended approach. I think most people would recommend against it. Um, and the main problem with that is that it has uh, low statistical power. That is, subgroup sample sizes are, are obviously smaller than the total sample size. They can be quite small. And so failure to reject the null hypothesis doesn't indicate lack of effect. Uh, also, uh, testing within subgroups doesn't really address the issue of heterogeneity of treatment effect directly. That is, you can have a statistically significant benefit in one sub subgroup, not statistically significant in another, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the, uh, that the magnitude of effect is different in the two subgroups. Uh, the difference in statistical significance could simply reflect, re reflect differences in sample size. So it doesn't directly affect uh, heterogeneity, uh, although that's not necessarily a bad thing, and I'll get to that point a little bit later as well. The next approach or next frequentist approach you could use is an improvement, and that is it's a test for interaction. That is, uh, it's to see whether there's statistical evidence that the magnitude of the treatment effect differs between subgroups. That is, is the difference that we observe more than one might have by chance alone. Uh, but that uh, approach is still problematic, and that is because multiple testing uh, can leads to a large potential for false positives. Uh, when we do many uh, interaction tests, we'll get false positives. And also, interaction tests are known to have very low power, leading to large potential for false negatives. So we get false positives and false negatives with testing for interaction. And so it's difficult to rely on that approach as well. In my, uh, in my experience in the uh, pharmaceutical industry, it seems like the typical approach is to examine a large set of subgroup analyses and conclude that there is no heterogeneity effect a heterogeneity of treatment effect unless there's compelling evidence to the contrary. Uh, problem here is that the definition of compelling is unclear. Now, typically you would uh, expect to see at least, at least see statistically significant interaction, but still, even in the case of significant interaction because of multiple testing, where that's, that in and of itself wouldn't be compelling. And so it's not, re it's not clear what we mean by compelling evidence. Uh, and also, uh, the problem with, with this approach is that uh, if we're going to take absence of evidence of, of heterogeneity as evidence of consistency, there's no uh, incentive uh, to enroll a, a diverse population. And this is a point that uh, Janet Wittes made earlier as well. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, um, 
there's growing interest in moving away from that traditional frequentist paradigm of just um, uh, um, concluding heterogeneity uh, or concluding consistency of effect unless we see strong evidence against it and moving towards a requirement of affirmative evidence of a treatment effect within specific subgroups. Um, now, um, it's, it makes sense that uh, some, uh, some interest groups would, uh, would be looking for this. For example, a regulatory agency uh, that's specifically responsible for the, uh, for the population that, that, uh, uh, um, that they represent, uh, they would want to see uh, affirmative evidence that the treatment is effective. So for example, the FDA would want to uh, have some assurance that the drug is effective in the US population and not simply that there's lack of evidence that there's difference, a difference across countries. It's not just regulatory agencies, but interest groups also have a, have a stake in obtaining affirmative evidence for a treatment effect within the specific subgroups. Uh, and uh, probably the um, best example of this, uh, this approach is the recent work and the recent uh, um, ICH document, E17, on multi-regional clinical trials. Uh, and that document even includes suggestive methods for, uh, for calculating uh, subgroup specific sample sizes or determining how to apportion the sample size across at least regional subgroups. Uh, but uh, but this, this interest in obtaining affirmative evidence, of course, it is, would apply to more than just regional subgroups. It would apply to all uh, different kinds of subgroups. Uh, but despite this, and despite the work by the, um, uh, by the ICH group on E17, it's still unclear how to determine when apparent heterogeneity of treatment effect represents true heterogeneity. It's unclear how best or how optimally to apportion the total sample size across subgroups when designing a trial. And it's still unclear how to define the required level of affirmative evidence. That is, what do we need to see? Do we need to see a p-value in a particular subgroup to decide it works there? Do we need to see a point estimate, a confidence interval? What, how is it that we, how would we define the required level uh, of affirmative evidence for a subgroup? Next slide, please. Uh, now, uh, other um, speakers, um, uh, Barbara Sil uh, Silva Collins and others have commented on this, that really um, uh, we, we focus on large subgroups because uh, that's basically the best we can do with existing methods or, or with at least with standard methods, but we really need to um, uh, to extrapolate to smaller subgroups and subgroups not studied, and not only to smaller subgroups, but to uh, cross classifications of subgroups that represent individual uh, patient characteristics. That is, um, uh, a, a person or a patient who's interested in or is considering taking a drug wants to know whether that drug works in that individual patient. Uh, and, and each individual represents a cross classification of characteristics. And so individual subgroup analyses don't really uh, address the, the problem that we would like to have addressed. Next, please. So a Bayesian approach, in my opinion, can much better address this problem. Now, uh, let me try to distinguish between uh, Bayesian uh, analysis of subgroups versus a Bayesian analysis of the overall trial results. Now, we have um, uh, on uh, participating in this conference some prominent Bayesian statisticians who I think would argue that it makes perfect sense to do a Bayesian al analysis of the overall trial results. Now, such an analysis would require some kind of prior distribution for the magnitude of the treatment effect. Personally, I am not part of that camp, and I would have always been very comfortable with frequentist analysis of the overall trial results, and I'm still comfortable with it. But I see a very big distinction between that and a Bayesian subgroup analysis, where we require just a prior distribution for consistency of the effect 
rather than uh, or regardless of what the magnitude of the effect is. Now, I think that it was uh, Dr. Unger who earlier made the point that in this regard, we're actually all Bayesians. And I would argue that, uh, that most people doing subgroup analyses, including those who think that they're doing a frequentist analysis, are actually using uh, Bayesian reasoning. Uh, and I have a, a few uh, quotes that I pulled from the literature that uh, hopefully will make this point. Uh, so first, that it, it, at the design stage, uh, in order to design a clinical trial, it's necessary to assume that the effect of the treatment will be relatively consistent across subgroups of potential importance. If substantial heterogeneity of the treatment effect across subgroups is suspected at the design stage, then the whole basis of the trial is undermined. So I think that that's a quote that many of us would believe in or agree with, uh, but it, uh, it, of course, um, in looking at that quote, uh, clearly, it implies that we have a prior that there, for consistency of effect and that when we analyze the subgroup results, uh, we should be applying that prior belief that the results probably are truly consistent across subgroups. Uh, second quote from Steve Lagakos, subgroup analyses are commonly overinterpreted and can lead to further research that is misguided or worse to suboptimal patient care. Well, why would subgroup uh, analyses be overinterpreted? One clear explanation for that is that uh, probably there are not uh, true uh, differences in, in effect or heterogeneity effect across subgroups, and that leads to the overinterpretation. And, and then finally, I promised that I would get back to uh, the uh, merit heart failure trial and the paper that focused on the um, the apparent lack of effect within the United States, uh, there's a quote from Hans Vedel, uh, which is that thus the best evidence of the treatment effect for any subgroup is the estimate for the overall trial. Again, a quote that I think many of us would uh, agree with, uh, but you have to be a Bayesian with a very strong prior that there's uh, probably consistency uh, of treatment effect across subgroups in order to make a statement like that. Next slide, please. So, um, so what's good about Bayesian, uh, a Bayesian approach? I think the Bayesian approach leads to shrinkage estimators that are very sensible. And so I've tried to illustrate the, um, uh, the shrinkage estimation here, the very, very simple example. Uh, but basically what they do is they combine uh, the observed treatment estimate with the prior belief in consistency leading to an estimate that falls somewhere between uh, the observed treatment effect and the overall treatment effect. And this is a very nice way of, uh, of, of accounting for random high bias. And so the, uh, the solid horizontal lines correspond to the observed results in the two subgroups, and there's an apparent difference between them in, in this hypothetical example. Uh, the dashed uh, horizontal lines represent the shrinkage estimators and the red arrows indicate the degree of shrinkage. So uh, the way these, these uh, estimators work is that the degree of shrinkage depends on the degree of true consistency between the subgroups. Uh, and the greater level of consistency, the greater the consistency, the greater the amount of shrinkage. So this is all very sensible and certainly, I think, an improvement over uh, frequentist approaches. Next slide. Uh, now, this, the approach does depend on this consistency parameter. Uh, and uh, so this parameter is a measure of the dispersion of the true treatment effect sizes across subgroups, which I've tried to illustrate here, where the, uh, the blue dots represent the true um, subgroup <coughs> Uh, effect or the true treatment effect within subgroups uh, for individual, well, across subgroups. And so there's a distribution of treatment effects then across subgroups. And the degree of dispersion uh, represented by the, uh, the red line is essentially this consistency parameter that's used uh, to, to obtain the shrinkage estimator. Now, importantly, there's different approaches that you can use 
uh, to obtain this consistency parameter. One approach is to just specify it, is to use uh, your knowledge, your scientific knowledge about <coughs> how likely uh, differences across subgroups would be, uh, and, uh, and maybe historical information on how consistent effects across subgroups have been in the past uh, with other similar drugs, and, and to specify uh, that parameter. And another approach is to estimate the parameter from the observed data, the more dispersed the observed <coughs> estimates across subgroups are, uh, the, the um, greater the dispersion factor that we use to obtain the shrinkage estimators. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Now, a problem, though, with this approach, as nice as it is, is it relies on an assumption called the exchangeability assumption, and that assumption is somewhat problematic. Uh, the exchangeability assumption is that all orderings of the true treatment effects are equally likely. Uh, and as I said, this exchangeability assumption is inherent in many of the Bayesian models that are used to obtain these shrinkage estimators. Uh, now, uh, and, and I've tried to illustrate that um, uh, by, the, uh, um, by the panels on the right. Uh, and so uh, as a simple example, um, let's say that the study, uh, study was done in three countries, Japan, Norway, and Sweden, uh, and we observed some differences among the treatment effects. Now, um, as you've probably guessed, I've chosen these three countries because um, we might have, uh, most people would have an expectation, I think, that, uh, that the treatment effect would be very similar between Norway and Sweden, two countries with similar, similar populations and similar um, uh, healthcare systems, and less belief or less strong belief that the uh, effect would be consistent from between Norway and Sweden and Japan, a country which has different population and different healthcare system. Uh, now, in the two examples uh, on the left, uh, the data conform to this prior belief where uh, the results in Japan differ somewhat from the results in Norway and Sweden, where they're similar, uh, whereas in the panel on the right, uh, the results uh, differ from our belief where uh, the results in Norway are different from the results in Japan and Sweden, which uh, uh, where they're similar. Now, the exchangeability assumption assumes that those two situations are equally likely, and uh, it would apply shrinkage in the same way in the two situations. Uh, now, this assumption, though, is inconsistent with the common wisdom that you'll see uh, in many published papers, and, and I think that would uh, that many of us would agree with, that it's important to consider biologic plausibility when interpreting the results. So uh, using, that, um, uh, using that prior belief of biologic plausibility, the left panel is much more plausible uh, than the right panel. The next slide, uh, I just have added uh, potential shrinkage estimators. So if we were to use a method that made the exchangeability assumption, shrinkage would be exactly the same in the two situations. And so uh, in the situation where uh, Norway and Sweden are similar and Japan is different, the results will be shrunk in, in exactly the same way as when uh, Norway is different from, uh, from Japan and Sweden. If we had, though, a method which could do shrinkage without making the exchangeability assumption, we could get what's shown in the next slide, uh, where the dashed line represent uh, potential shrinkage estima estimators without the exchangeability assumption, where in the left panel, where the results conform to our prior belief, uh, that there would be little shrinkage uh, and that we would have shrinkage estimators which continue to show a difference between uh, Japan and the Scandinavian countries, whereas in the right panel, uh, there would be much more shrinkage pulling the estimates for Norway and Sweden closer to each other. And that might be a, a, a more realistic approach than one where we did make the exchangeability assumption. Next slide, please. Oh, so here's a, an example which I think crystallizes the issue, or at least crystallizes it for me. Uh, let's say that we had a binary subgroup category, for example, men and women, 
And suppose the treatment effect were known with certainty in one subgroup. And let's say we knew with absolute certainty that the treatment effect had a benefit of say 10 units in men, but we have zero information of, on the effect in the other subgroup, say in women. What would be the best estimate of the treatment effect in women? Now, presumably uh, with zero information in women, our best estimate of the treatment effect would probably be 10 the same as it is in men in most cases. However, it would be 10 plus or minus something. Uh, and, but the question is then plus or minus how much? How confident are we that the effect in women would be the same as it is in men? And I think when thinking about uh, the problem in that way, I think we have a good understanding of that consistency parameter. At least to me, it helps me understand how to interpret that consistency parameter. I think most investigators would have a sense of the answer to that question of, of, uh, of plus or minus how much. Um, and based on, uh, on their experience reviewing subgroup analyses, based on a scientific understanding of the differences between how, uh, differences between how drugs work in men and women. And, um, and then, it, so by using uh, your knowledge and specifying the variability, I think, uh, between the subgroup pairs is one potential way to avoid the exchangeability assumption. And this is uh, an issue that I have some research interested in and I'm um, uh, working on a method which hopefully can implement that. Next slide, and I just have a couple of more. Um, so now, uh, suppose we did have a method, a Bayesian method or other method that did provide us with, uh, with results that we felt confident in. And let's say we were confident in a particular shrinkage approach and we have shrinkage estimators. How then do we turn that into what we're looking for, which is affirmative evidence of a treatment effect in specific subgroups? How would th we then use that information to decide whether a drug uh, is effective in men or is effective in women? So the Bayesian methods would allow us to calculate the level, level of evidence, including importantly extrapolation to subgroups that are not studied. So using a Bayesian method, we could calculate the probability that the treatment effect exceeds zero or the probability that the treatment effect exceeds some minimally, uh, minimal clinically meaningful effect size. Once we have that though, we still need to define thresholds. Thresholds for the level of evidence required uh, in order to recommend treatment for use in a particular subgroup. I, I don't underestimate how difficult it would be to define such thresh, thresholds, but I do think that they actually are critical. And once we have the thresholds, uh, the benefit that we get from that is it number one, provides us an incentive to enroll a diverse population. That is, if you need to exceed that threshold, uh, if a, sp a sponsor of a clinical trial needs to exceed that threshold in order to, for have it, to have its drug recommended for use in a given a subpopulation, there's an incentive to have more than a trivial number of patients enrolled in the trial from that population. And it also provides a basis for statisticians to come up with optimal approaches for allocating uh, patients across subgroups. Gives us an, a basis for choosing subgroup specific sample sizes. Final slide is just posing some uh, questions for, for the group to ponder and hopefully things that will get discussed across, uh, as, the, um, as the conference continues over the next day or two. Uh, what is the goal of the subgroup analysis? Is it to evaluate heterogeneity of treatment effect, estimate benefit risk within subgroups, uh, or to determine whether the level of evidence for benefit exceeds a pre-specified threshold uh, within subgroups? Um, and the question of extrapolation, are we interested in effects only within uh, within the subgroups studied in the trial or an extrapolation to subgroups that are not studied in the trial? Um, do we prefer a frequentist paradigm or a Bayesian paradigm? Uh, and if we're using a Bayesian paradigm, uh, should we specify that consistency parameter or estimate it from the data? And uh, uh, is the exchangeability assumption reasonable or do we need methods that avoid the exchangeability assumption?
So uh, that's the presentation and I thank you for your attention. Steve, that was just um, terrific as always. And um, you know, you always get me to think in new ways. So lots to discuss here. Um, but before we do that, let's hear from Scott. Um, and I believe that you're uh, showing your own slides, Scott. Yes, uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, and are you able to see slides? We are. Okay, great. Let me just put that in presentation <clears throat> mode. Um, and uh, well, good morning, uh, everyone. I uh, hope that you and your families are all doing well during these uh, difficult times. Uh, thank you to the Multi-Regional Clinical Trials uh, Organization and the FDA uh, for organizing this important meeting and uh, for inviting me to be a part of it. I'm pleased that we're able to share our ideas with each other virtually. Uh, with that, I will begin. Um, I would like to uh, uh, talk about basically about two different things. Uh, the first uh, uh, topic I'll talk about is a somewhat neglected issue, but a, an important one, I think, in subgroup evaluation. And that is a sort of benefit risk evaluation within the subgroup. We often identify and evaluate subgroups for either a primary efficacy outcome or a safety outcome, but uh, not really uh, the two of them together. And it's not really a one dimensional problem. And then I'll make some comments about uh, subgroup issues. And uh, so uh, I'm gonna start out uh, just by giving you uh, a quick quiz. Uh, suppose a loved one uh, that you have is diagnosed with a serious disease and you get to select treatment. And there's three different treatment options, uh, A, B, and C. And suppose uh, that there are two outcomes, and for, for simplicity, let's uh, consider them uh, uh, equally important. Uh, this uh, efficacy outcome uh, that's binary, uh, treatment success, and a safety outcome that's also binary, uh, whether you experience a safety event. And luckily enough, we had a randomized trial that compared uh, these three outcomes, and so uh, these three uh, treatments, and uh, so we can look at the outcomes to help us make a decision. Now suppose we had 100 patients in each arm, uh, A, B, and C. The treatment success rate, uh, the efficacy was 50% in A, B, and C. They were all the same. Uh, the safety event rate uh, was 30% in A, 50% in B, and 50% in C. Uh, so which treatment do you choose? Well, uh, they all have the same success rates. Uh, A's got the lowest uh, safety event rate. Uh, B and C are basically indistinguishable. Uh, so clearly we would choose A, a reasonable choice. Uh, but instead of, so what we've done here is we've analyzed our two outcomes. Uh, we took the patients in the trial and we analyzed the outcomes. But um, let me flip that upside down and say, instead of using the patients in the trial to analyze those outcomes, uh, what if we use the outcomes in the trial to analyze what happens to the patients? And if you think of it that way, what we could do is we could cross classify uh, for the, the treatment success with the safety event uh, in each of the three arms. And it turned out that in arm A, uh, the treatment success and the safety event were uncorrelated. So there were 35 patients out of those 100 that had the treatment success uh, and avoided the safety problem. In treatment B, they were positively correlated. So there were zero patients that had treatment success and avoided the safety problem. And in treatment C, uh, there were 50 patients who uh, had the treatment success and avoided the safety problem. Now, um, now, one slide ago, uh, treatments B and C were indistinguishable, but uh, clearly there's a very different things going on in treatment B and C. Uh, now, this is a extreme hypothetical example to make a point, but um, now what does this have to do with uh, uh, subgroup evaluation? Well, I'm getting to that. Uh, the idea is that what you might consider to be the clinical trial arithmetic has never been quite right. That uh, compare and combine is not equivalent to combining and comparing. And what we traditionally do in trials uh, is we take each outcome individually, we make a comparison between uh, treatment and a control, and then uh, we do that for each of those outcomes, and then we combine that in some way uh, to, as a benefit risk analysis. Uh, but uh, combining information outcomes within patient is what expresses how well a patient is doing. Uh, 
And if we combine the information with inpatient and then compare them, uh, that is, a, is actually a better reflection of uh, the impact or, or the comparative impact of the interventions on patients. So as my father told me uh, many years ago, uh, the order of operations is important and the way we put the information together is important. Now, what does this have to do with subgroups? Well, of course, a negative trial may not mean the treatment is good for no one. Uh, a positive trial may not mean that it works for everyone. And so how do I identify the subgroup of patients you want to treat? Well, let's return to our example. And uh, we may do studies to uh, identify predictive markers uh, for efficacy. And what would they identify? Well, they'd, they'd identify uh, these 50 patients in A, uh, these 50 patients in B, and these 50 patients in C. Uh, but many of these patients are actually patients with safety concerns, uh, namely these 15 in A and these 50 patients in B uh, have safety concerns. They're not the patients you want to treat. So now we could look for predictive markers that identify safety issues, and that would identify uh, the patients in the bottom row here. Uh, but of course, uh, that identifies some patients that don't really benefit, including these 35 in A and these 50 in B. So such approaches don't necessarily identify patients that you want to treat. And if we're going to think about personalized medicine and subgroup evaluation being a first step to that, um, I think we need to think more about uh, benefit risk evaluation rather than trying to think of it as a one-dimensional efficacy or safety problem. So um, the way I think about this is uh, if you were to plot, uh, say, the number of outcomes we have in trials uh, today, um, we have a, a couple of efficacy outcomes typically, and maybe a couple of safety outcomes, maybe perhaps some quality of life outcomes, um, uh, but and, and estimate a, a, often a single effect estimate for each of those outcomes. And so that's where we represent uh, where we are now. Um, but to get to personalized medicine, we have to get to uh, this place down here, uh, the future target. Uh, but we have to get there through the right path. And uh, the way we get uh, downward here is through composing the information within patient. You characterize the disease burden or the experience of patients. Uh, and then we use uh, personalized medicine and subgroup evaluation to try to get um, uh, sort of more effect estimates uh, based on patient characteristics. Now we have to be very careful about how we do that and potentially incorpor incorporate preferences. So I wanted to just show an example or two of how this plays about. And uh, so a couple of years ago, we wrote a paper uh, that's encourages thinking about using outcomes to analyze the patients rather than the patients to analyze the outcomes. And um, think about that play on words and what that means. Uh, and we had another paper called the Desirability of Outcome Ranking or DOOR. And uh, behind this idea though is uh, before you analyze several hundreds or several thousands of patients, uh, which uh, we typically do in trials, we have to figure out how to analyze one. And by that I mean, how do we compose information within patient? We're measuring these outcomes to tell us how patients are doing, yet we don't actually evaluate uh, sort of a, t a, a, a global patient outcome very often. And you can think of this as the patient journey uh, through the trial, a synthesis of, of benefits, harms, and quality of life. So I'll show you uh, one or two examples of this. Uh, this is a, a, an example of a drug, an old drug called colistin uh, and a relatively new drug, uh, ceftazidime avibactam, the treatment of infections due to CRE, uh, one of these superbug infections. This was an observational study, but uh, just for illustration, there was a, a, a door outcome, a desirability of outcome ranking with, and it had four levels. And so the, the top level, uh, the most desirable outcome for a patient is the patient lives and uh, they were discharged home uh, without uh, uh, some of these complications. The worst outcome on the bottom is death. Uh, but in the middle, there's a couple of uh, sort of intermediate uh, outcomes for the patient where they lived, but not everything went, went right. They're either still in the ICU or, or they had some toxicity, uh, serious toxicity or both. And what you're hoping for is that uh, if you had a new drug, you would try to get sort of a northward migration of patients in these categories on new drug relative to uh, a control or something 
Now, uh, you can calculate, uh, we, we uh, have been calculating uh, something we termed the door probability, the, which is a probability of a more desirable global outcome uh, when assigned to a, uh, a new therapy versus a control. So um, this was a small study, but uh, this is how the numbers fell out in this Callistin Kazavi uh, example uh, and the distribution of the door outcome, the four levels of the door outcome. And uh, we had uh, a, a estimated a door probability of 64%, and you can get an interval estimate of that. Now, this is somewhat of a, an unusual um, a metric for many trials who are traditionally calculating hazard ratios or differences in means or proportions. But um, uh, when you think about it, it's somewhat intuitive in the sense that uh, if you're a clinician or a patient and wondering, um, will I be, you know, in an overall sense, better off on a new drug relative to control? Uh, what's, you know, what's the probability that that's going to happen? And so um, this does have an intuitive interpretation. Now, another way you could analyze these is instead of uh, doing a rank-based analysis is to think about uh, something we term partial credit, which uh, basically scores these four categories uh, similar to an academic test. And if you have the most desirable outcome, then you get 100. And if you die, you get a zero. Um, if you have an intermediate outcome, then you're going to get partial credit. And we've used a couple of different ways at getting that partial credit, one through quality of life measures and others by just uh, surveying uh, expert clinicians about a, a grading key in this particular case. And what this allows you to do is that if you had unequal steps between these categories, uh, you, could, you could account for that using this approach. Um, and you could also actually tailor an analysis to uh, an individual perspective about uh, how you would value uh, these outcomes as a, as a patient. And we've done uh, some of that too. So the big question is who benefits from uh, this particular therapy? And I'd like to show you uh, uh, sort of an extension of that. Um, and for here, I'd like to show you uh, an example from a clinical trial the International uh, Breast Cancer Study Group uh, conducted, uh, 1,700 uh, uh, postmenopausal known negative women who had surgery in, and, and were randomized to either tamoxifen or tamoxifen plus CMF and followed uh, uh, out to five years. Um, and this, uh, these Kaplan-Meier plots uh, show the disease-free survival in two different subgroups, uh, the estrogen receptor status negatives on the left and the positives on the right. And what you see on the left is uh, for estrogen receptor status negative uh, patients, uh, CMF uh, appears to have uh, a benefit uh, uh, when you add it to tamoxifen. Um, uh, but on the right, uh, the, the positives, uh, no such benefit uh, seems to occur. Now, uh, the issue here is that uh, receptor status uh, is not really a dichotomy. It's uh, somewhat more on a continuum. And could we evaluate the continuum to figure out um, uh, which women uh, may actually benefit from the addition of uh, CMF? And so uh, there's, a, there's a methodology called STEP, uh, subgroup treatment effect pattern plot, um, which is sort of a moving average uh, type of a, a strategy. And what you see on the top panel here is the five-year disease-free survival, a sort of a moving average of five-year uh, disease-free survival uh, by treatment uh, as a function of um, uh, estrogen receptor status on a, on a continuum. And on the bottom, you can get a, a, an estimate of the difference between those two um, uh, um, of the two treatments. And uh, there are ways in which you can get uh, both uh, a point-wise uh, confidence uh, band, but also a, a sort of a global confidence band around this. And you can see where the, the benefits of CMF uh, come into play and where they dissipate in this particular scenario. So um, in thinking about the benefit risk problem, we've combined uh, this uh, door and uh, step idea. Uh, and I, I, in returning back to the Kaz Abbey Calliston example, uh, one question was, well, who is benefiting uh, from, from uh, this new treatment? Recall the, the, the door probability was 64%. Uh, you got a better probability of, of having a more desirable outcome with, 
with uh, ceftazidime abibactam compared to colistin. Um, and what we've plotted here is uh, the, the pit bacteremia score is uh, on the horizontal axis, and that's a, a measure or, or a, a metric of uh, sort of disease severity uh, in this uh, population. Uh, higher scores are more severe disease, baseline severe disease. And we plot the door probability on the left side, but we also did a partial credit version uh, scoring those middle categories as 80 and 60 on the right. And what you see is that the benefits of uh, this new particular drug uh, actually is most uh, prevalent in uh, the most severe disease. And uh, there's often a question in these, in these infection trials about whether you should enroll less severe patients because uh, the most severe patients often die and you won't have enough sensitivity there uh, versus a competing uh, theory says, well, don't enroll uh, uh, the least, uh, the, the patients who are not very sick because they're gonna recover anyway and you won't have much sensitivity for detecting effects there. Uh, but here it was clearly the, uh, or it, it appears that uh, the most severe patients are, are where uh, the benefits of the new therapy are occurring. So let me show you uh, one last example of how you might think about this. It was a recent trial uh, that compared uh, two different durations of antibiotic therapy for uh, un uncomplicated uh, bacteremia, which is a, a blood uh, infection due to gram-negative uh, bacteria. And the result of this study was that seven days was non-inferior to 14 days on a binary uh, efficacy endpoint. But if you think about bacteremia, there's uh, several major events that can happen during that patient journey. Uh, first, of course, is mortality, but uh, other major components or outcomes for patients are whether they have a clinical failure or relapse. Uh, often there are infectious complications or uh, some type of toxicity or serious adverse event. So we had looked at a, a desirability of outcome ranking, sort of an ordinal outcome. Uh, the most desirable categories on the top there, the patient is alive with none of those events. Uh, the least desirable is death on the bottom. But as you have more and more of those events, you begin to slide down uh, the scale of desirability. So one question might be, uh, you know, whether there are subgroups uh, that uh, affect uh, this particular door outcome. And this particular plot is on the, on the horizontal axis is a baseline uh, functional status. Uh, there's four categories, either patients are independent, uh, some might need assistance with activities of daily living, some have a dependency in activities of daily living, and some are bedridden. And uh, this is uh, treatments combined, so this has nothing to do with treatment, but what you can see here is as, uh, as patients have a sort of worse baseline function, uh, treatment outcomes, according to DOOR, are worse. Uh, so the blue on the top is mortality. You see mortality increases as you go from left to right. Uh, you see the green is the most desirable category. A patient is alive with no events, and uh, that decreases as you go from left to right. And so here you can see that baseline function, functional status appears to be potentially uh, prognostic for outcome, uh, perhaps not uh, surprisingly. Um, but the big question is, uh, does uh, that particular baseline uh, outcome uh, predict um, uh, response uh, or, 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 or interact with, with treatment? And so here are these uh, plots uh, broken out by treatment uh, seven days on the on the left and 14 days on the right. And if you just look at the independent uh, patients, for example, there's a very similar distribution of the door outcome for independent patients. But for the bedridden patients, you see quite a bit more uh, uh, higher percentage of uh, mortality in the seven day arm than in the 14 uh, day arm and quite a bit less of the most desirable category where you're alive with no events. And so uh, there is a, a significant question here about whether func baseline functional status is predictive here and whether that would uh, influence that treatment. So um, now we could perform a partial credit analysis. I asked a, an expert clinician, uh, give me a, a grading key for this. And he graded those middle categories, 80, 65, and 50. And uh, we could actually plot uh, the difference in mean scores uh, based on this partial credit scoring system uh, for each of these four categories and get uh, uh, confidence uh, 
uh, bands around it uh, to try to get a sense of um, the consistency of effect or how much heterogeneity there is. So um, I'm going to end on uh, just uh, sort of uh, making a few comments about subgroup issues more broadly. Uh, of course, the issues with replicability implications are there's often more false negatives because the within subgroup ends are, are, are modest. Uh, there's more false positives because of multiplicity issues and data dredging. Um, and if you don't have pre-specification or if you're fishing with selective reporting, there's a lack of context for even understanding error control and interpretation. Now, pre-specification doesn't control error itself, but it does provide a foundation for implementing methods that, that do give you some control. So, uh, and then when you're modeling, uh, model validation is gonna be needed to separate those that gen uh, hypothesis generation versus confirmation. So I wanted to just show uh, a couple of uh, uh, examples where these sort of issues have come into play. Um, this is uh, the ISIS-2 trial, the second international study of infarct survival, a randomized trial, uh, factorial trial of streptokinase and, and, and aspirin after uh, MIs. And both of these interventions improved outcomes. Uh, uh, aspirin uh, reduced uh, vascular mortality by 23%. Uh, but uh, Upon further evaluation, aspirin increased mortality in two subgroups, and those two subgroups were Geminis and Libras. Now, of course, the, this, uh, uh, this was done uh, purposefully by the authors here uh, to try to make a point that, um, you know, the more you test, the, the more errors that might be made. Uh, this, of course, doesn't make any sense, but um, you know, they, they, they wanted to make this point uh, about multiplicity and how you can sometimes get yourself into trouble. Um, now, uh, of course, uh, the probability of a false positive finding increases as the number of subgroup evaluations performed uh, increases, and you can clearly plot that out about uh, once you hit around 14 subgroups that are tested, uh, even if there's nothing going on, you got to more than half the time, you're going to have a false positive. And it makes you wonder, uh, particularly uh, with uh, multiple testing and also with selective reporting, whether uh, many of the subgroup uh, um, uh, outcomes that are reported are, are about uh, how much random uh, randomness plays into that. And there really is an underappreciation for chance findings in many cases. Uh, this was the PRAISE trial, which evaluated uh, uh, whether a particular drug uh, reduced uh, uh, cardiovascular events. Uh, it was a negative trial, uh, although they did evaluate uh, uh, several different subgroups. And in one of the subgroups, um, if you look at the bottom of this, uh, you see that the, the, overall, uh, the overall result for the PRAISE-1 trial was not significant, but um, the non-ischemic uh, subgroup in PRAISE-1 actually looked quite promising. And so they repeated, a, or they did a second trial, PRAISE-2, that focused uh, specifically on this particular uh, subgroup, um, but it uh, clearly uh, did not replicate uh, a subgroup evaluation from, from PRAISE-1. Now, um, Steve had mentioned uh, uh, um, some of the issues, uh, and so I won't spend too much time on them, but um, I think the, of course, pre-specification is a very uh, fundamental and important aspect of subgroup analyses. And so these are planned and documented, ideally in a protocol or an SAP prior to examination of the data. And this does provide us context for interpretation or framework for error control, or if in the underestimation for coverage probability, understanding cover, coverage probability rates, um, in the, particularly in the face of, of multiplicity. Whereas post hoc, uh, not necessarily in that scenario. Um, and so that th those types of uh, analyses may be driven by the observed data and have to be interpreted uh, with, with great caution. Now, um, Steve did mention the pre versus post randomization characteristics. And so we're primarily interested in, in uh, those characteristics that are defined by baseline, uh, pre randomization baseline factors, uh, such as demographics and so forth, uh, potentially baseline disease characteristics. Um, 
However, uh, uh, we do see subgroup membership often determined by factors uh, after randomization. For example, per protocol analysis is a, is a subgroup evaluation uh, based on post baseline factors. And these comparisons made on those types of populations are not necessarily protected by randomization. And so we have to be very careful about uh, uh, those types of uh, 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 evaluations uh, as they're, um, uh, they're more susceptible to bias and uh, um, essentially susceptible to biases uh, uh, similar to those in observational studies. Now, heterogeneity, uh, I think one key point to remember is this, uh, there's a couple of different types of interactions that can occur. One is the quantitative interaction where one treatment is better than the other, but dif by differing magnitude versus a qualitative interaction where one treatment is better than uh, for one subgroup, but worse for another. And this is especially important to recognize. And you see uh, potentially in the PLATO trial uh, that, that this was happening, it appeared to be that ticagrelor had a protective effect in much of the world with the exception of North America. It seemed to be going in the other direction. Um, so this is uh, particularly important to actually recognize and remember as we think about methodologies moving forward. Now, when you assess uh, heterogeneity, there's some very common mistakes. Uh, uh, one is you claim heterogeneity based on observed effect sizes within each subgroup, ignoring the uncertainty in those estimates. Um, by looking at uh, uh, hypothesis tests within each subgroup, and uh, you can also uh, uh, come up with uh, uh, um, problems there. I'll show you a ex quick example of that. Uh, you could potentially claim heterogeneity based on non-significant interaction, which we know we often have a fairly low power, um, or making conclusions regarding heterogeneity without careful consideration of the metric. I'm going to show an example of that quickly too. So one common error is conduct a statistical test within each subgroup and then compare the p-values. So for example, you might compare treatment and control in the males and get a nice low p-value favoring treatment, but in the, fe in the females, uh, not so much uh, in terms of p-value. Um, is, so is the appropriate conclusion that the treatment's better in males but not in females? Well, perhaps a closer look at the data might reveal that, well, the estimate of the effect in males and females is not different at all. Uh, what was driving the p-value was just a sample size issue. And so there's not heterogeneity of effect here, despite the fact that the p-values were quite, quite different. Another thing to remember is the metric. Um, here you see uh, response rates for males and females, uh, both in treatment and control, and you see a relative risk of two in males and also a relative risk of two in females. So is there heterogeneity of effects? Well, uh, on the relative metric, no, uh, they have the same relative risk. Uh, but let's take a look at the risk difference measure. Uh, difference between five and 10 is 5%, and the difference between 30 and 15 is 15%. So if you're looking on an absolute metric, uh, there is heterogeneity and the metric matters. And this does have important implications for model-based analyses because uh, models are thinking about uh, particular metrics. So the typical approach is you test the interaction first and proceed with subgroup inference only if uh, significant interaction. But of course, there's often low power for this interaction in many cases. So uh, if you want to estimate the effects within these subgroups, of course, the simple method uh, is to use only the data uh, from that subgroup. Um, and the pro of this is that uh, doesn't require assumptions regarding the relevance or applicability of data outside the subgroup. Uh, the con is that uh, it may be inefficient and you may have limited data elsewhere. Um, but then you get to the more complex methods, usually trying to use models uh, uh, using data from outside the subgroup. And the pro being more efficient, but the con being a reliance on modeling and its as associated assumptions. Um, and being model uh, and assumption free is, is uh, the foundation or the, uh, the ideal place to be for uh, robustness of results. So uh, a couple of things to remember about these models is uh, you could do a marginal model uh, using fixed effects, which assumes a linear relationship of the 
of the outcome or transformed outcome with the covariates, or the conditional model uh, that uses random effects, which assumes a, a linear relationship of the transformed outcome with the covariates and the random effects. And uh, the assumptions for the conditional model are a bit stronger. Uh, they have uh, some assumption about uh, the distribution of the random effects and that the random effects are orthogonal to the regressors. And if that assumption does not hold, then the estimator is not consistent, meaning that the estimator does not converge in probability to the truth as, as you get uh, larger sample sizes. So the big question is, well, which, which model do you select? And uh, technically, the models estimate different parameters, and thus they address different questions. And so the simple answer is, well, use the model that estimates the parameter you're interested in. Um, now, there's different perspectives on when to use those fixed or random effects. Uh, some say use fixed effects when interested in specific levels, or there's exhaustive coverage of those levels, or if it's a, sort of a structured part of the design. Now, I think the cost of model errors, and all of those models are uh, likely to have some degree of error. Uh, all models are wrong to a degree. Uh, but that cost of those errors, particularly for qualitative interaction, is, is worth uh, thinking about carefully. The other thing that can be done, and there are some answers in checking the model assumption validity or model diagnostics, I, I think uh, one of the biggest, uh, uh, perhaps outside of the statistical community, uh, I'm not sure people are paying attention to the model, uh, the model assumptions anyway, the statistical community may pay attention to it, but there's quite a bit of variation in the confidence of those model assumptions holding. Uh, there are methods to assess model fit, uh, both in uh, marginal models as well as conditional models. Uh, we had done some of, the, some of this with binary outcomes years ago. So in conclusion, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I think su successful subgroup evaluation really starts in design uh, with pre-specification of, of subgroups, uh, the plan for how you're going to assess heterogeneity, uh, plan for error control or uh, coverage probability uh, control and, and, and context uh, by defining processes, including mal uh, model validation for identification and testing of those subgroups. And thinking uh, more critically, uh, I know uh, teams don't like to do this. They don't like to have enrollment quor uh, quotas. But um, if you really want to uh, make inferences about subgroups, um, you know, one thing you can do in design is make sure you enroll patients into those subgroups and uh, prospectively. Uh, so the imperatives are. Uh, you know, make sure you do a thorough assessment of heterogeneity, uh, understand multiplicity com complex mo model validation, a cautioned interpretation, chance really does play an underappreciated role. And so you'd have to careful appraisal of sort of biological plausibility and whether it's as evidence is consistent with other studies. Uh, I think identifying subgroups based on benefit risk is an important consideration. We might consider pre-specified procedures that are built into design for identifying subgroups with a positive benefit risk profile. Um, realizing that different models have different assumptions and may estimate different parameters. Uh, and lastly, uh, so one idea is we do have forest plots in publications, but they could include both uh, population averaged uh, and subgroup specific uh, estimates of effect. And uh, I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, really uh, compelling discussion and one that we're going to unpack a little bit later. Um, I know that we're pressed for time now and um, I think we should go on to the next panel. Uh, and we certainly have a lot of time parked for conversation tomorrow. So please do post your questions and, and thoughts so that you don't lose them. Um, and we'll get to them next time again. Thank you so much uh, to both Steve and Scott. Um, and let me turn it over to Lee. Hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Lee Chen. I'm an executive director of Bow Statistics at Amgen. Um, it has been uh, such a rewarding experience for me to be part of the MRCT Diversity in Clinical Trials Working Group. Um, so learning from everyone from a very diverse background. This session will focus on statistical methods. We'll have five presentations from the distinguished panelists. With the 10 to 12 minutes each, we hope to have some time 
for Q and A following the presentations. Uh, this promised to be a thought provoking session, so I look forward to you participation. Please use the Q&A or the chat function to submit your questions. So in the interest of time, I will not uh, read the bios of the panelists. I encourage you to read them in the bio booklet posted on the program page. So without further ado, it's my honor to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Stuart Pocock, a professor of medical statistics from the London School of Hygiene and the Tropical Medicine. Professor Pocock? Yes, thanks very much. Yeah, um, on my screen, it may look like I've got a strange tropical disease with spots all over my face. That's because there's a one coming in. Can I interrupt? I, I have a little trouble hearing you very clearly. Can everyone you else hear? No, we're not hearing you well. You've got a significant background. Uh, do you have. Well, I'm misleading, come in again. Okay. So maybe so, um, that's my only suggestion. Shall I do that? Sure, unless you have earphones or another. No, no, it works well. Lee, do you want to? Should we wait for a minute? And sorry, I couldn't quite hear what. Uh, uh, should we wait for a minute, or do you want to go on to the next? Uh, yeah, I don't have any oh, much better. Thank you, Stuart. Okay. Yeah, I didn't take Perfect. long. Perfect. Okay. Um, as I was saying, I've got funny spots all over my face due to a lovely sunset in Madrid shining through the screen. <laughs> but ignore me if you don't want to look at me and more importantly, look at my slides. Um, yes, we're talking about statistical methods and I threw in the word challenges as well. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, much of this we've said already, uh, we know that patients are not homogeneous and there may be legitimate differences between patients in treatment effect. Number two, trials are usually not large enough to detect those with any power. Number three, there are many possible subgroups we could investigate with all the risks of data dredging and false positives. And number four, we do not rely on p-values within subgroups interaction tests are really the way forward. Uh, next slide, please. So what I'm gonna do is take you through four, maybe five examples um, very quickly. The first is topical, it's the recovery trial of patients with hospitalized COVID-19 and the positive results from the steroid dexamethasone published online uh, a few months ago in the New England Journal. Um, the, you can see that the, there was a two to one randomization, by the way, so you have more patients than on usual care than on dexamethasone, because there were lots of other treatments they were also comparing, four others, in fact. Death within 28 days was highly significantly lower. You can see a mortality rate ratio of 0.83 and a p-value of 0.001. So you've got proof beyond reasonable doubt of an overall treatment benefit. And I think that's an important situation for them exploring subgroups with real meaning. So next slide, please. And in this trial, the subgroups really did show something rather interesting. It turned out that you needed to be in need of respiratory support, and even more so if you were on invasive mechanical ventilation for the positive effect on reducing mortality of dexamethasone really to show up. And you can see in this forest plot that those not needing respiratory support, no oxygen received, there was really no sign of any treatment benefit. In this case, the P for heterogeneity was less than 0.001. Then the New England Journal's current policy means they don't allow you to show a P for heterogeneity. So I've smuggled it out of the chi-squared test for trend. Um, that's a little dig at the New England Journal's approach to subgroups at the moment. Um, and treatment benefit was therefore confined to patients getting respiratory support. So an overall, uh, next slide please. So overall, if you look halfway down this slide, given a highly significant overall benefit, really gives subgroup analyses then can come into their own. And if in turn you then show a highly significant interaction, that can help refine who really needs a new treatment. I'll go on to the next slide, please. So that's the first very positive statement about subgroup analysis. 
Now, there's the more muddy side of sub, the messy side of subgroup analyses, and that's when you don't have an overall positive result. You're disappointed, but it doesn't necessarily mean you give up. Mind you, other people might wish you give up, but that's another matter. Um, the Paragon trial, Paragon in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, was a drug combination, Sucubitril Valsartan versus Valsartan alone. Very large trial, 35 months follow-up. And you can see at the bottom of this slide, the primary event, which was a combination of all heart failure hospitalizations and cardiovascular deaths, using repeat events for the non-fatal hospitalizations. And you can see that the relative risk, the risk ratio or rate ratio was 0.87, which had a p-value of 0.006. Now, an overall p of 0.006 does not prove no effect, but it's not exactly exciting. So next slide, please. So then they pursued 13 pre-specified subgroup analyses, and two of them were so-called interesting. Firstly, it looked like the effect was confined to females and not to males, with a highly significant interaction test, P of 0.006. And then they studied left ventricular ejection fraction. Those with a moderately impaired ejection fraction below 57% showed more of an, a treatment effect, and there was no effect apparent in those above the median ejection fraction of 57%. You could analyze that potential interaction in two ways. Firstly, categorical, as here, and you get an interaction P of 0.03, or using ejection fraction as a continuous effect modifier, and then you get a more pronounced interaction P of 0.002. They were allowed in the New England Journal a modest subgroup claim, which said that the drug combination may benefit patients with heart failure, not frankly reduced, but less than normal. But I feel we all feel this was not a strong claim. Um, probably the problem was they had an active comparator. It may be that the combination is brilliant against a placebo, but that was never really studied. So this is rather left in the air as to whether it's a really important finding or not. Next slide, please. Then I turn to subgroup problems when you have both efficacy and safety. This is a trial called TEMIS, and it's adding ticagrelor uh, or versus placebo on top of aspirin in patients with stable coronary disease who also have diabetes. Very large trial, 19,000 patients followed for over three years with the standard primary composite outcome of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, or stroke. The hazard ratio for that composite was 0.9, a modest effect with a modest p-value of 0.04. So the headline in the ESE was making a positive claim, but that rather ignored the fact, um, which was clear in the publication, that there was an excess of major bleeds on the group receiving Ticagrelor. Hazard ratio 2.32, which was very, very highly significant. Next slide, please. But what was striking was the TEMIS trial simultaneously had a subgroup analysis publication in the Lancet. This was looking at the efficacy and safety split by whether the patient had previously had PCI or not. And we show the treatment effects, Ticagrelor versus placebo, on an absolute scale, the difference in event rates which is, I think, is the appropriate way of looking at things rather than on a hazard ratio scale. For the primary endpoint, you can see for those with prime prior PCI, it looked like the treatment effect was bigger, 1.3% reduction rather than 0.3% in those not getting PCI, but the interaction p-value was not significant, it was a p of 0.16. If worked down the list, you see that that was pretty well repeated. There was no evidence of a PCI being an effect modif a modifier, until we read the line I show in bold, which is a newly defined variable called irreversible harm, which was um, post hoc and included all cause death, MI, stroke, fatal bleed, or intracranial hemorrhage as a, as a composite. Then they claimed that in patients with prior PCI, there was a marked reduction but not so in those without prior PCI. 
and the interaction peers 0.012. The Lancet allowed this to become a major conclusion that Tychagra law provided a favorable net clinical benefit after prior PCI. But my take is much more cautious. I think this was a subgroup analysis on a post hoc endpoint, and I personally would have not made it into a major conclusion. Uh, next slide, please. Just to say, I think there are actually three types of true interaction if they exist. We're familiar with the terms qualitative and quantitative, but I think there's a middle ground one called all or nothing. And that is the treatment only works in the subgroup and doesn't work in the rest. And that's plausible and could be important if it happens. Whereas the qualitative interaction is very rare, having treatment effects in opposite directions. And the quantitative interaction is quite common, but doesn't particularly matter because the treatment still works in everyone. Next slide, please. The subgroups I really like and think matter most are subgroup analysis by patient overall risk. Because so far we're looking at one factor at a time, whereas it's the whole patient that matters. And if you can classify patients into low risk and high risk patients, you may see a marked trend in absolute benefit across those risk categories. The TIMI-50 trial here of Varopaxar versus placebo is an interesting example. It's a very large trial overall in all patients. Varopaxar showed a very highly significant reduction in the primary efficacy outcome of CV death, MI, or ischemic stroke. We then created a multivariate predictive model to classify patients into low risk through to high risk and divided them arbitrarily into risk quintiles. And you can see the sharp risk gradient that ensues. And I think this sort of subgroup analysis should be done in every trial because you can see that high risk patients benefit more and that may affect the cost effectiveness and other things in deciding who should get uh, an efficacious treatment. In this case, I'm going on to show there was also a safety outcome, gusto moderate or severe bleed, which was also very markedly increased by the use of varapaxa. So my last two slides of results, next slide please, show now doing the multivariable predictive model for efficacy, on the vertical axis and doing a different multivariable predictive model for harm on the horizontal axis. And then putting every patient on the plot, all 17,000 of them, um, as a, a rather overloaded scatter diagram. But what it enables you to see that this tremendous variability in absolute benefit on the vertical scale and this huge variability in absolute harm on the horizontal scale. Plotting the two simultaneously enables one to make an interesting judgment as true treatment benefit risk trade-off in a favorable direction. The red line is the line of equal trade-off, but then one needs to recognize that the efficacy outcomes are more clinically important than the bleeding outcome. They impact more on mortality. So a mortality weighted trade-off is the dotted um, line going up the middle there. And then on the green side, you have patients whose benefit is, is bigger than the harm. And on the pink side, the lower region, you have the opposite, those whose harm is greater than the benefit. But next slide, you may decide instead that the benefit has to win by substan substantial amount. And I think one should um, therefore perhaps say the benefit needs to be at least 20% at least greater than the risk. And then the green covers a somewhat smaller proportion of patients. And I think this benefit risk trade-off as heterogeneity is, is a way forward in looking at trial data where you have efficacy and harm simultaneously present. Last slide. Um, just I think I've summarized most of this. I think many have said it already. Um, I'll just say the last two points. Subgroups by overall patient risk are particularly useful. 
an individualized benefit risk trade-off is another thing that I think we should be doing more with, with many treatments. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Polcock. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ravi Varakhan, uh, Professor of Oncology from Johns Hopkins University. Professor Varakhan. Thank you, Lee. Uh, good morning. Um, so, um, as if uh, subgroup analyses don't have enough problems, I'm going to introduce one more. This is something that's uh, not commonly recognized. So this is the problem of confounding in subgroup analyses. When we look at uh, subgroups uh, and, and potentially infer uh, differences in treatment effects across subgroups, uh, just pause and ask the question, is that really due to the subgroup that I'm looking at or could it be confounded by other factors that are correlated with the subgroup? Next slide, please. I would like to thank uh, um, one of my FDA collaborators, Dr. Su Jane Wong. She and I worked on this uh, a few years back. And I also want to thank uh, Dr. Bob O'Neill of the FDA for actually introducing this problem to us. And I want to acknowledge uh, uh, Dr. Barbara Beerer of MRCT and other conference organizers for uh, inviting me to this uh, conference with such eminent speakers. Uh, next slide, please. So um, just a little brief background on the setting. Uh, of course, everyone knows this really well, but I just wanted to frame it so there are no um, uh, issues with the notation that I would be covering. Uh, subsequently. So you imagine a trial um, with uh, two treatments and patients are characterized by a number of covariates at baseline, uh, the vector of covariates indicated by bold X. And then there is a treatment T, which is considered to be binary typically. And you're interested in estimating uh, ideally a, a treatment effect theta that varies according to this uh, vector x. So this is the ideal, right? If I told you a vector x, you can tell me what the treatment effect is on, on any scale defined by g. So for example, it could be just a simple uh, absolute risk difference, which where g would be the identity link, or it could be um, a relative risk with the log link or odds ratio with logit link. Um, next slide, please. And typically these treatment effects are reported as uh, forest plots, these uh, subgroup analysis effects. Uh, and uh, these uh, subgroups, it should be noted are unidimensional subgroups, so one variable at a time. So when you're looking at sex, male versus female, you don't consider their age distribution, for example. Or when you look at uh, another variable, such as uh, diabetes, uh, pre-existing conditions, then you don't consider the sex distribution or age distribution within those two subgroups. So in, in such a way, you have these marginal or unidimensional subgroup effects that are presented. So the question is, is it possible that the subgroup differences that you see could potentially be due to other factors and not the subgrouping variable itself? Next slide, please. Okay, um, I already said that the conventional subgroup analyses are unidimensional and there is possible confounding. And this issue, to my knowledge, was um, first uh, raised by uh, Gronwald in a paper, Annals of Internal Medicine, back in 2009, where he was discussing the effect of aspirin on stroke. Uh, and apparently, it was a case that the effect was larger in women. Uh, compared to men, but then uh, women have a different age distribution. So they tended to be older compared to men. So the question is, is it really due to biological sex differences or is it due to biological age difference? So what uh, we propose here is a, a technique called standardization or inverse probability weighting uh, to eliminate this confounding. This is of course a well-known technique in epidemiology to, to account for confounding. There are many papers on this, uh, such as the marginal structure models that are well known there. 
Uh, next slide, please. So here, what we propose is instead of that, that if you remember the vector X, um, so what we are defining here is a treatment effect based on a single baseline covariate X sub K. So we are sort of ignoring the other covariates uh, in, the, in the vector baseline covariates. Uh, next slide. And typically what is done is, uh, you know, you see either forest plots or, or you can uh, look at interaction models that are marginal interaction models or univariate interaction models where there is an interaction between the treatment variable and the covariate or subgroup of interest. So this gamma terms here denote the uh, uh, interaction uh, coefficient and people typically test whether this interaction coefficient is statistically significant. And if it is, then they report individual subgroup effects. And if they're not, then uh, they, they don't claim any subgroup differences. But again, the problem here is that you have multiple comparisons. And, and also the issue that I'm addressing is that they don't account for correlation between covariates. Next slide, please. So a um, little bit of mathematical notation here, just to motivate the, the inverse probability weighting or the standardization idea. So when, when the covariate that we are interested in X sub K is potentially not independent of some of the covariates in the remaining baseline covariates, right? So X sub K is not independent of other covariates, right? Then the subgroup inferences could be misleading. So, so if you want to estimate this marginal treatment effect where you integrate out the, the variation due to other covariates, right? We can write this marginal treatment effect mathematically in a slightly different way shown in the second integral, right? Where, where this additional factor uh, F of XK divided by F of XK given the other covariates. So this is, this is the standardization factor, right? This factor sort of equates the distribution of other covariates within the subgroups, right? So, so if we can then uh, reweight the analyses by this factor that's shown in the integral, um, then we should be good to go. So the subgroups are balanced in terms of potential confounders. Next slide. And, and then you can, you can conduct a, a weighted uh, regression analysis, like the, the interaction models that I showed previously could all be weighted by this weights W sub K, right? Which is the ratio of the prevalence of the subgroup level divided by the prevalence within um, the other covariate values, right? So this would standardize the distribution of the other covariates. Next slide. So um, for, for, for small number of subgroups, the weights can be estimated non-parametrically. You know, you can just go within each discrete subgroups and look at the tables and, and calculate the joint probabilities and you can calculate the weights non-parametrically. But more generally, I think you would need to estimate the weights using a, a model-based approach so that uh, you don't, uh, you know, if there are any sparse cells or things like that, you could potentially borrow information across cells. Uh, and for variance, you may want to use something that's um, robust, like a, you know, Huber estimation for variance. And then you can actually present the standardized forest plots instead of the usual forest plots. Or in addition to the usual forest plots, you may want to show the standardized effects as well, right? And this can be done with many uh, tools that are available. For example, in R, you can use the survey package to conduct these regressions with weights. Um, next slide, please. And I just wanted to mention a point here that um, when you um, do these marginal subgroup effects, uh, where you integrate across uh, the other covariates, right? This idea of collapsibility should be kept in mind. Uh, for certain treatment effect scales, like you know the absolute difference, uh, where the scale is identity scale, you, the effects are collapsible. That I can just integrate over other covariates, and it'll maintain the the um, 
mathematical nature. But when you are talking about other like odds ratios uh, as treatment effect scales, uh, then these treatment effects are not collapsible. Meaning that if I take um, treatment effects in different subgroups and I average them, I won't get the overall treatment effect um, because of the non-collapsibility, right? Okay, next slide. Uh, yeah, I think I, I just mentioned this. Okay, next slide. Here's a simple example just to illustrate the idea of standardization. So suppose you have two, two subgrouping variables, uh, gender and age. I know age is a continuous variable, but just for the sake of illustration, I'm just gonna show uh, uh, as a discrete group. So, so here, the probability of being young is different across men and women. So men tend to be younger compared to women, right? And men are six times as likely to be young th than women. So a naive comparison of men versus women subgroup analysis would indicate treatment effect differences that are potentially attributable to age differences. So we may want to uh, equate the age differences, right? And so here the standardization can be quite useful. Okay, next, next slide. So we standardize the age distribution of men and women by assigning different weights to men and women, right? So you assign a weight of half to each young man, which is equal to the ratio of the, the probability of men divided by probability of men among the young, and a different weight to old men, right? And so once we assign these weights, you can look at the resulting table, and these would be completely uh, balanced across age distribution, as well as the other way too. If you look at the age distribution, the distribution of men and women will be balanced in the young and old group. Okay, next slide, please. So just want to raise some key issues in standardization. I think it is a nice idea, but then there are some problems, right? Um, when is, first of all, when, when should we um, address confounding? Uh, typically, this is not a major issue if the correlation between any pairs of covariates is not that large. Um, what we have found in our simulation studies is that typically a correlation less than 0.3 does not merit uh, uh, adjustment for confounding. But if it is larger than 0.3, then you may want to consider confounding adjustments, right? And then the question of what is the appropriate reference distributions to standardize, right? Uh, here, the example that I showed, we used um, the entire trial sample, right? Instead of, you know, so we, we um, standardize it to the distribution of the entire trial population, ignoring the treatment assignments, right? But another population could be the at-risk disease population. If you have that information uh, distribution of covariates in that population, you could standardize to that population. But then a major issue is that this uh, standardization can increase the variance of your estimator. While it uh, reduces the bias due to confounding, it increases the variance. Sometimes the increase can be pretty large. So you have to ask the question, you know, is the bias variance trade-off worth it? Okay, next slide. And here are some, some papers um, that you could uh, look at for more uh, in-depth coverage of this problem. And I appreciate the opportunity once again, and, and thank you. Thank you, Ravi. So in the interest of time, um, let me do a time check. We have about 30 to 35 minutes left for this session. So um, may I ask the rest of the panelists to speak uh, about 10 minutes? So um, up next is Dr. Mark Rothman, uh, Director of the Division of Biometrics 2 from the FDA. Dr. Rothman. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. I'm um, going to talk a little bit about uh, base hierarchical models and shrinkage estimation and drug trial snapshots. Uh, next, please. I'm going to talk first just start off with a, an issue in subgroup analysis that's been mentioned already uh, that sort of underlines many of the issues in subgroup analysis. I'll talk, talk about drug trial snapshot, just have one slide there. Uh, but related to that is a story and an impact story that we, we published 
June of last year. And then I'll go through an example of implementing shrinkage estimation through a Bayesian article model. And after that, I'll, I'll make a comment or two quick on uh, something in Steve's presentation. Next slide, please. Random highs and random lows are very common in subgroup analysis, particularly when you examine many subgroups. And one reason for that is the total variability and the sample estimated treatment effects across subgroups consists of two components. One of that is the variability in the underlying true effects, which is my second sub bullet there. And the other is the within subgroup variability or random sampling variability. So the, the sample estimated treatment effects across subgroup do, do tend to vary more than the underlying true variability and treatment effects across subgroups. Next slide, please. The importance of shrinkage in estimation. Uh, well, it's to address quantitatively the random highs and random lows. You do get greater precision, narrow 95% confidence intervals, because you make use of, of more information. And for the model that you choose, and you should choose the most appropriate model, and I'll make comments on that later, uh, you are going to come up with that set of estimates or estimators that do, do give you, if you use squared error loss, the smallest mean square error. And I lift a, a couple of references here, a book chapter Jean Pinello and I wrote, and a paper by Lipinski, Lipsky and colleagues on the importance of shrinkage estimation. Next, next slide, please. So we've been doing <clears throat> drug trial snapshots for Five, five plus years, and Loka talked a bit about them, and Rob put in some diagrams from our five-year report. As I mentioned, we published an a impact story a year and a half ago. And I'm going to talk about the story in the impact story. N next slide. Next slide. <clears throat> All right, physicians often make treatment decisions based on their past experience with patients on what outcomes those patients experience when given that treatment. Next slide. Let's say there's a new drug and sex may or may not be an effect modifier, but nothing else is considered a possible effect modifier. The physician has experience on the use of the new drug in outcomes of two males and two females. The next patient, a female, is prescribed the new drug from that physician. What might the physician expect for the outcomes that she may receive? Well, they're probably going to use the information that they know from all four previous patients. And they might give a little more weight to the females than to the males on the outcomes that were reserved. Next slide, please. Now, as the physician's experience grows in giving this new drug, and they have the results and outcomes from more and more males and females, next patient is female. How, what might the physician consider in determining what might be the outcome that this female may observe. Well, how much they might consider the relevancy of the results from males depends on two things. How similar are the results from males to the results from females? How similar are their distributions? And how much data do you already have on females? If you have a great amount of data on females alone, you have pretty price, precise information on the distribution outcomes on females just from the females alone. You probably aren't going to rely too much on the males in that case. But those are the two things that need to be considered. Next slide, please. Well, this is exactly how shrinkage estimation from a Bayesian hierarchical model works. Data from a subject in a given subgroup are more relevant than data from a subject outside that subgroup 
for a patient outside that subgroup, the relevancy of their information goes to zero as the number of subjects in the subgroup of interest grows or goes to infinity. The data decides how much borrowing is done. And that depends on the ratio of variability of within subgroup variability to the between subgroup variability and treatment effects. Less borrowing is done when that within subgroup variability decreases. When that subgroup sample size increases, less borrowing needs to be done from outside the subgroup. Next slide, please. Uh, so this diagram also appears in that impact story. And the point here is in, in the upper plot, you have a bit of variability in the estimated effects, which are represented by the dots. And within each subgroup, you have a bit of variability. So there's going to be some amount of shrinkage, and the shrinkage will be towards the overall average. In the bottom plot, within each subgroup, you have very precise estimation, very narrow 95% confidence intervals, and the estimated treatment effects vary a lot. Um, so we have precise information within each subgroup. We're not going to borrow very much, so the shrinkage estimates here wouldn't change much at all. Next slide, please. An example. Thank you. Uh, so the leader trial was a cardiovascular outcome trial that compared liraglutide product for type 2 diabetes to placebo. Primary endpoint was time to first major cardiovascular adverse event. It was, it was done as a requirement to rule out an increased risk of 30%. The overall result was an estimated hazard ratio of 0 0.87 with a 95% confidence interval that was entirely below 1. So a significant result of, of reducing the risk of a major adverse cardiac event. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's the results by region. And Asia, Europe, North America, the rest of the world. The fewest events were observed in Asia, and that's why its 95% confidence interval is wider. Its upper limit is almost three times its lower limit. And it had a bit extreme of, of an estimated effect or hazard ratio of 0 0.62, so a random high. And you see the other estimates there. Uh, North America one was fairly neutral in its estimate 1.01. .01. Next slide. So we, we use this model uh, to do some shrinkage estimation. Um, due to time, I won't go into why the particulars in this model, but, but here's the model. Next slide. So the shrinkage estimates are on the right-hand side, and we see, next slide, for Asia, uh, that shrinkage estimate, the hazard ratio went all the way up to 0 0.80, so moved quite a bit towards 0.87, the overall estimate. And the confidence interval now has an upper limit that goes to 1.09. Next slide. For North America, the, the estimate moved towards 0 0.87 and it moved to 0 0.936. Uh, which, which a confidence interval with that whose upper limit is now 1.115, uh, so even smaller than 1.220. Okay. And if you compare all the shrinkage 95% credible intervals to the respective 95% confidence intervals, you'll see that the former are noticeably narrower, narrower than the 95% confidence intervals. I think that's my last slide. Uh, one, yes. Uh, so, so let me make a, a comment. You should always use the best model. And if, and one thing we ask is uh, internally is, are there any known effect modifiers? So, if you think something is a, a known effect modifier, you should include it in the model. And then what would be quote unquote exchangeable would be the residual effects. The residual effects would be exchangeable, not the 
the underlying treatment effects. And if you thought that uh, things in, that there might be a Scandinavia and non-Scandinavia difference, but within Scandinavia, things might be exchanged, but we might do that. Uh, have Scandinavia versus not Scandinavia be exchangeable, and within Scandinavia, Norway and Sweden be exchangeable. And that would take care of uh, the issues Steve brought up. Uh, but you should always use the best model, and you do need to consider whether there, there are, for example, effect modifiers, and if there are, you should include them in the model. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rothman. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Steve Ruberg, President of Analytic Thinking and an adjunct professor of statistics at Purdue University. Dr. Ruberg? Okay, thank you very much to the organizers from MRCT at um, <clears throat> Harvard and FDA for organizing and the invitation to this meeting. And a special thanks to Dr. Beer who was diligent and steadfast in her efforts in getting us organized for this meeting. I'm going to be talking about always do subgroup identification with emphasis on the word always and identification, uh, which I will highlight uh, coming forward. Now, next slide. Uh, I like to start with this story where Alice in Wonderland is wandering through Wonderland. She comes to the Cheshire Cat where there's two roads that diverge in the woods and she says, where should I go? Cheshire Cat says, depends a great deal on where you want to get to. She says, I don't care much where. And the Cheshire Cat says, it doesn't matter then which way you go. And Alice continues, so long as I get somewhere, which time the cat says, okay, you're sure to do that if you only walk long enough. And I think that's a relevant lesson for us in talking about this subgroup and heterogeneity problem. Next slide. So my outline is, what is the goal? I'll talk a little bit about homogeneity of effect, a little about heterogeneity, and then I'll spend time on subgroup identification, what I mean by that, and what I mean by discipline subgroup search, uh, and some concluding remarks. Next slide. So the question is, what's the goal? What do you want to, do you want to find a subgroup or not? Um, many times the answer is no. We want to roll out spurious heterogeneity, as we've seen in examples that have been given about gender, race, or region. But there's times when we want to find heterogeneity and we want to confirm that there is some biomarker that is predictive or some baseline severity or history. Uh, and I think we lump these all together when we see these forest plots in our publications and results. It's all lumped in there together and it's not clear what are you trying to do. Next slide. So when you're looking at homogeneity, you're kind of thinking about playing defense and you're looking at routine baseline factors and you're hoping you don't find anything unusual so that you can say your drug works um, uh, consistently across many subgroups and you want to try to avoid kind of unusual findings and uh, um, Steve Snappen presented this uh, this diagram that occur or appears in the FDA label and in the publication on metoprolol where there was unusual findings or heterogeneous findings in US and non-US in um, male and female. Next slide. And that shows up in the label, the FDA label, that says these weren't necessarily pre-specified and subgroup analyses are difficult to interpret and we don't know whether this is chance or not. And I claim this is not very helpful. Um, patients and physicians rely on us in the drug development business and in the regulatory world to, to give them solid advice, not to just say, here's some unusual findings, we don't know what to make of it. Next slide, please. And it shows up in other disease areas. We haven't, we've talked a lot about uh, on, uh, survival in cardiovascular trials and other things, but in belimumab for uh, lupus, same thing was found where there was an unusual interaction with, uh, with black and non-black patients. And the FDA label actually says, although no definitive conclusions can be drawn, you know, be cautious about um, using Ben listed in this, in this population, which I don't think is very helpful. Next slide, please. And of course, um, Pito in his, one of his many publications on this topic said many clinicians and regulatory agencies pay too much attention to sub subgroups. And in the cases uh, with belimumab, potentially uh, to the detriment of the care of individual patients, you may be steering people away from uh, such uh, treatments unnecessarily. Next slide. Um, you've seen the ticragalore example, so I won't go over that. Next slide. 
but I do think it's an important example. Again, in the label, it says we have to be cautious. Next slide, please. Um, the good news is that the North American effect uh, turned out to be apparently due to concomitant use of aspirin. And so it does say in the label, which is much more helpful, that maintenance doses of aspirin above 100 milligrams should be avoided. Um, so here's an example where subgroup analyses actually enlighten the medical community to some sort of interaction here or some unusual medical or biological phenomenon um, that turned out to be very useful in learning how to use ticagrelor. Next slide, please. So the question is, how can we as statisticians in the medical community better communicate the credibility or lack thereof of subgroup findings? I'll give the answer to that question in a, in a moment. But let's go on to the next slide and talk about heterogeneity, where we're looking for a subgroup of patients, so-called marker positive, that have measurable characteristics and on average have an exceptional response compared to the complementary subgroup. Next slide, please. And here's a situation, again, referring to Pito, where I've heard he has said, always do subgroup analyses, but never believe them. And I'm going to be talking about subgroup identification uh, in contrast to subgroup analyses. Next slide, please. For this example, I'm going to choose ramaciramab uh, versus placebo in hepatocellular carcinoma, a uh, phase three pivotal trial known as REACH. Um, there's not a lot of good treatments for hepatocellular carcinoma. This was a well-done trial, the usual double-blind randomized trial. The analysis was on overall survival in an intent-to-treat population, a large study. And the hazard ratio um, for the overall population was 0.87 with a, 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 an unremarkable p-value of 0.14. But when you look at the publication and you look down at all the subgroups that were looked at, um, next slide, please, there is a liver um, enzyme or protein here, alpha feta protein, uh, for where a, a high level of this alpha feta protein seems to confer a, uh, or produce a much better effect of ramaciramab in this subgroup, an interaction p-value of 0 0.006, and again, the hazard ratio of 0 0.67. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. So this leads to my next question is, when is a subgroup finding so compelling that it should be believable or actionable, irrespective of the overall finding? Let's just do a thought experiment and say, what if in that high alpha feta protein group, the hazard ratio was 0.5 or 0.4 or 0.3? Should we pursue that? Is there some sort of imperative or if that population represented 50% or 60% of the population? In, the current, in that study reach, it represented 45% of the population. So that's a question that I will hope to give an answer to as well. Next slide, please. So the distinction between subgroup and analysis and subgroup identification is that um, kind of what was, was uh, presented by um, Dr. Unger earlier that he identified three different types and, and subgroup analysis is type two and three. It's exploratory, doesn't control type one error and really is very, not very helpful at all. Subgroup identification, however, is a systematic approach using disciplined subgroup search, which I'll define subsequently, and I give the reference here below for more detail. Next slide. So subgroup search, discipline subgroup search is characterized by pre-specification of whatever subgroups or biomarkers you're gonna use, the algorithm for identifying those subgroups, the complexity of subgroup definitions, that is allow for interactions amongst the biomarkers, so two or three way interactions. All the characteristics that we talk about in the ICHE9 guideline for um, for, for credible statistical analysis can be applied in this notion of pre-specification here. Next slide. The discipline subgroup search approach should adjust for multiplicity, um, p-values, and also bias correction for treatment effect estimates due to selection bias from multiple subgroups. Next slide, please. The DSS characteristics say the biomarker effects, you should be able to separate prognostic versus predictive effects, allow interactions between multiple biomarkers, and this notion of partition that when you go through this subgroup analysis or subgroup identification, I'm sorry, you can identify what are the optimal cutoff values for a continuous biomarker. Next slide, please. It looks something like this, an illustration taken from real life, but disguised a bit here. Uh, my preferred approaches are using things like uh, regression trees, classification trees, survival trees, where you can split the population. Here's just an example of a hazard ratio 0.89, p-value 0.08, but look at on the right-hand side, patients with below normal EGFR, 
um, have a 25% reduction. Whereas if you take it another level down to a particular biomarker, people with a low biomarker have a 50% reduction with a highly significant p-value. And if you do all this, next slide please, using the discipline subgroup approach, having pre-specified your covariates, um, adjusting for your, your p-values and estimates, it's statistically precise, allow for interactions and the, and the classification algorithm selected the cutoff values. Next slide, please. Then you can have a very interesting discussion about the effect size versus the population size. Um, people below EGFR uh, or below normal EGFR represented 45% of the population. The people who had both that and low biomarker represented uh, about 25% of the population. So now you can talk about those trade-offs. Next slide, please. So can a pre-specified analysis plan suffice as a viable mechanism for producing subgroup findings? Next slide. And think about with ramaciramab, it went back and did a second confirmatory trial, the REACH2 trial, with this high level pop or high AFP um, alpha fetal protein level and got a result where the hazard ratio was 0.71, nearly identical to the, the first REACH trial. Next slide, please. And my question is, is had this DSS been performed in REACH, could we have saved four years and hundreds of millions of dollars and allowed tens of thousands of patients to access to this effective medication sooner rather than having to do some exploratory analysis that no one knows how to interpret and then have to repeat all of this work? Next slide, please. So discipline subgroup search should be done, I think, in all situations, whether the p-value is greater than 0.05 or less than 0.05. To make the latter point, I'll go to the next slide quickly. With pemetrexed, it was originally approved in non-small cell lung cancer, had an overall positive effect, p-value 0.01 on overall survival. But subsequent analyses and subsequent trials showed a marked difference between squamous and non-squamous histology. You can see on the left, a hazard ratio of 0.27 versus on the right for the squamous cell, point, or 1.56. And had subgroup identification been done in the initial trials, rigorously, um, this could have been identified and perhaps a bunch of patients who initially were treated with Pemetrex and squamous cell carcinoma patients would not have been given the drug. Next slide, please. So my quote is always do subgroup identification using discipline subgroup search so that the results are more interpretable. Next slide. Always do subgroup identification, define what you're trying to do. Of course, biological plausibility and replicability are important. And you can do this on a benefit risk variable as well. It doesn't have to be just an efficacy variable. Next slide, please. So as Lewis Carroll said, if you don't know where you're going, any path will do. I like to say, if you don't know what you're asking, any answer could be true. Last slide, please. Thank you. I hope you found a subgroup of you found this interesting, informative, and enlightening. And I've got more on my analytics thinking blog if you want to go there and read more. Thanks, and I'll turn it back to you, Lee. Thank you, Steve. Indeed, uh, enlightening session uh, talk. So our last speaker is Dr. Lisa Lavange, professor and co-chair of the Department of Biostatistics at the University of North Carolina. Professor Lavange. Thank you, Lee. And I am sharing my screen, is that right? It's coming. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if people can see this. All right. How is that? Can Let's you see? Go. Okay. So yes, thank perfect. you so much to um, the organizers of this symposium. This is a terrific conference. All of the speakers today have been fabulous. Um, I am uh, the one person who can maybe help us end on time. So I'm going to go really quickly. Most of what I would say has already been said much better by others anyway. Um, but I had wanted to end on a note of thinking about health disparities and what we can do uh, through either trial enrollment or subgroup analysis. So um, I will start with a couple of very old slides. I have used these slides in a class that I teach here <clears throat> at UNC. Um, and they've worked well, uh, the trying to think ahead of time about your subgroups. And I like, it helps me to think about why I even care about subgroups. And I think about, first of all, those that I usually want to report for, that would be including the demographic subgroups, where I really don't expect differences, but I may see them and I have to be prepared for that. 
Um, the differences by geographic region, <clears throat> many of the example trials you've heard today, the leader trial, the placer trial, uh, they see geographic, we see geographic differences, but we don't really believe the differences are due to some geopolitical border that was drawn. It's probably due to something else, patient characteristics, other those are intrinsic factors or something about the practice of medicine, access to care, diet, lifestyle, uh, the aspirin hypothesis in Plato, for example. And, um, and that's what you really want to get to. And the, one of our speakers just a few minutes ago talked about the confounding factors and that would play here as well. And then the, the last would be the subgroups that you absolutely expect, and you don't just expect them, you design your trial for them. And that would be uh, some kind of tumor type that the drug is targeted, something that, uh, that you know in advance and you, you are all about the design. Uh, and then of course there's two problems. One, we see differences, we don't know if they're real or not. You've heard this already today. And the second is, but I really would like to estimate the effect in some of these subgroups. And in some cases, they're too small. And we've heard uh, Mark Rothman and also Steve Snappen in this session talk about the power of Bayesian estimates for subgroups, which I am a big fan of. Now, two things happened when I was at FDA that more or less collided with each other. One, the ICHE 17, which is not the focus of today, but um, this is the guidance for multi-regional clinical trials, which very much got the conversation going, at least with um, a lot of people around us, Estelle Russett Cohen, myself, um, the, uh, counter, our counterparts at the EMA and PMDA, uh, as well as other regulators, about what to do with regional variability in a global trial, which is nothing but the subgroup problem, right? And the focus here, I think, really was to try and get people to think about not the geographic boundaries and the differences there, but the factors underlying those. And think about them ahead of time so that you can plan for them. And we also did come out in the, in the guidance and emphasize the potential for some kind of shrinkage estimator, much as what Mark talked about with the leader trial, uh, to help with these region-specific effects and to, to um, to, well, to give you something, because why? Well, you're talking to regulatory agencies that may want an estimate of the effect in their country. Um, if it's studied or if it's not studied, you want some ability to estimate that effect. There are decisions that depend on it. So at the same time that Aloka Chakravarti was um, also working on this, um, as well as a representative from the Center for Biologics at FDA, and we were very involved in the training materials. And believe me, we use the PLATO trial as, as a big training material. I, we, there was some concern, mostly espoused by me, that we run the risk of every study trying to find their aspirin hypothesis, and there might actually be studies where we don't find that aspirin hypothesis, or we worry about too many subgroups to find it. But nonetheless, uh, I think this guidance I have opened a few doors for innovative thinking. But at the same time, as Mark talked about, Anna Loka also mentioned this today, earlier this morning, the drug trial snapshot um, was launched as a way to show exactly who was being recruited for trials at FDA regulated, who were coming into these trials. Were we getting minority populations, for example? Um, and how successful were we? And the early versions of the snapshots um, showed results for efficacy and safety by subgroup, and sometimes the subgroups were really small, uh, and the estimates weren't very reliable. Um, so the Office of Biostatistics got involved, and this is something that I think is critically important, because I do think there's a lot of confusion around subgroups and what you can say about a subgroup, and the statistician's role is really important. Now, Mark took this over after I left, and you've seen what he's done. It's been incredible. Um, the, his impact story he already told you about. If you haven't read this, you really need to read this on the website. I give this to my students to read. It's just a great uh, teaching tool. And one of the um, drugs that, uh, one of the early drugs approved here, I had a representative from the pharma company uh, come talk to my class last spring, and, and they were very excited about the whole idea of the um, use of Bayesian methods when subgroups are really small to, uh, to check for differences posted on the snapshot. So just my last moment of talking here, I wanna go back to the beginning. Before you even have subgroups, you need to have patients in your trials and why is this important? Now, Janet Wittes 
on the first panel talked about this why and, and why do we bother if we don't really expect subgroups uh, to differ and if we see differences we dismiss them and why even care and of course there's lots of reasons to care and she gave you several of those um, but this I just pulled this up from uh, uh, the RA drug that I mentioned um, this is just an example of what you see on drug snapshots and this is the race ethnicity ethnicity background and you can see that that this is not anywhere near representative of the US population uh, in, or in, in terms of um, and I'm actually, I need to check and see if this was just the US. But in terms of what you would see, this is a very uh, white population here. And one, one thing, you know, the problem is that um, sampling, sampling to be representative of a population is not something typically done uh, during clinical trial design and enrollment. And it doesn't necessarily have to be. We rely on randomization to give us our ability to make inference about what a drug does and whether it's safe. We don't rely on probability sampling, certainly. And there's no expectation that you're going to be truly representative. But when the disease uh, is hitting underrepresented or underserved populations, then the trouble begins. And many of you, I'm sure, have been overwhelmed with news about all of the COVID vaccines Recently, um, the active initiative that Francis Collins began in March uh, is looking at vaccines as well as uh, drug trials. And this is a tremendous collaboration. I've got the wonderful opportunity to be involved in the master protocol aspect of it. And to date, five of these master protocols have been launched in populations ranging from the um, outpatient population infected but not yet sick enough to be hospitalized inpatient ICU and non-ICU and even post-hospitalization. I encourage you to read about these if you haven't, but a big focus of these protocols is trying to enroll the population that is suffering from this disease and we know that there's an over-representation of minority populations in the COVID-19, um, uh, well what COVID-19 is hurting. And so I just, I just want to commend the investigators. This is just a, an FNIH slide of all five protocols. And you can see they've launched, uh, didn't even start talking about these till March. And they've launched, we've launched five uh, since then, which is just like nothing I've ever seen uh, in my whole work at, of clinical trials. But every one of these, look at the number of sites. The sites are around the world. They're going to the hotspots where the disease is. You can imagine that in the hospitalized trials, it's much easier to get the population in the representation that you want because that's who's in the hospital, but you at least have to go to the hospitals serving those populations. Outpatient is much more of a challenge. And we've gone to the ACTG, the AIDS Clinical Trial Group Network, because of their experience getting hard to reach underserved populations. It'll be interesting to see, I checked it to see if I could share with you any of the demographic data so far, and it's not public yet, so I can't. But I just wanted to end on this note because I think we do need the tools that we're talking about with subgroup representation. But one of the really powerful ways that those tools can be used is to help address or to help at least understand health disparities. And if we don't have the right people in the trials, it's going to be tough to do. So that's all. I'll just turn it back to you, Lee, for whatever time we have left for, uh, for discussion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Melissa. I'd like to thank you all the speakers for keeping us on time. Um, I do want to take a moment to introduce our six panelists, Dr. Kathy Fritsch, Fritsch a statistical reviewer from the FDA. Unfortunately, um, we will not have time for Q&A today. I hope we'll have time for discussing more statistics tomorrow. Uh, back to you, Barbara. Uh, did, you, did Kathleen want to make some comments? Kathleen, did you want to make some comments? Oh, you're muted. I, I'm not. I'm not muted. Kathy. There we go. Can you yes, hear me now? You. Yes. We can. Okay. Thanks. thanks. Just, you know, I think, you know, a lot of the speakers today have done a great job of pointing out a lot of the problems and moving towards a lot of the solutions, and I think, you know, really what we need to do is, you know, push the incentives towards trying to do this planning and do these uh, methods for doing that because many times if, if we just want to have 
hope that everything looks good when we look at the subgroup analysis and not have to do anything. In many trials, that does work out. But if we can move the incentives towards those times when we do find the subgroup analyses that do make it challenging, it can really help if we can um, get people to move towards doing the planning. So thanks to all the speakers who gave a lot of proposals along that line. Thank you so much, Kathleen, and thank you, Lee, and thank you to all the speakers of this wonderful panel. Um, occasionally, at least for, for me, it got a little technical, but I'm, I'm happy to say that I was able to abstract even from that. Some principles and sort of suggestions embedded in the discussion today that I think we'll pick up on tomorrow. Um, I won't give a short summary now, which I had planned. Uh, what I will say, could I have the next slide, is that we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Um, and uh, starting again at 8.30, with apologies to those on the West Coast, we're going to be starting with a discussion of uh, you know, more Bayesian approaches to the statistical methods, and then a real discussion of comparison amongst those. Um, uh, various statistical methods, which are quite a lot of time for discussion tomorrow. Um, I personally have a number of questions I've written. I hope you all think about it tonight and we're really thinking through where do we go from here? What we, we understand there's a problem. I think we've heard today a brilliant uh, discussion of you know, not only that there is a problem, but the depth of complexity of that problem. And now we'll, what we need to spend much of the discussion tomorrow is where do we, what do we think we learn? What do we think we should do? And how should we approach this together? Um, so with that, let me thank you all. And um, ask Sade if you have any closing comments. Hi, Barbara. Um, really, no additional comments. Just want to echo your thanks to all of the speakers for the very informative and engaging discussion. And, and I think that I really look forward to, I have a number of questions that I wrote down too. So I look forward to continuing the conversation tomorrow and the presentations and discussion that we have scheduled for tomorrow. So again, um, thank you to everyone for your time today and look forward to continuing the conversation tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening.